This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Good morning. Three minutes after ten is the time. Shall we? Shall we get Idiot's Corner open nice and early today? Were you, were you listening a couple of minutes ago, or do you wait for ten o'clock to strike? Do you wait for the bells to strike ten before you dare turn on your radio? If you were listening a couple of minutes ago, you'd have heard me say that Wes Streeting reckons his latest policy is going to upset middle-class lefties. Now, I grant grant that you can't see me, so you can't actually see me put my tongue firmly into my cheek. But when I then said, oh, I don't know know where we're going to find any, I presume you got the joke, right? Uh, I I, I wouldn't be conceited enough to claim that I was a a paragon or a doyen of middle-class lefties, but I think the cap certainly fits. So I was talking about myself. When I, for once, <laughs> when I pretended not to know what a middle class lefty was, step forward, Greg in Aldershot, James O'Brien, he writes, you saw a middle class lefty in the mirror this morning. So nice and early, a nice and early opening for Idiot's Corner this morning, Greg. I'm sure I, I, I might be a bit lonely to start with, but you sit tight, my friend. I'm sure that there'll be company along in a minute. So I obviously am what could be loosely described as a middle-class lefty. And Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, who, for the record, I'm um, broadly impressed by, uh, reckons that it is precisely people like that. It is middle-class lefties who will be most opposed to the party's plans to use the private sector to reduce NHS waiting lists. He suggests that there is spare capacity aplenty in the private sector to cut the waiting lists for everybody. So the very simple calculation or the very simple arithmetic would be that the NHS would spend, would would give some of its budget to private sector companies who would then give some of that money to shareholders and, and, and investors. But in the great scheme of things, this would be the best available solution to a problem that I don't think anybody would deny the existence of. And, and he, he is fairly clear about who's going to upset, who is going to be upset by this. Middle class lefties cry betrayal, he said. The real betrayal is the two tier system that sees people like them treated faster while working families like mine are left waiting for longer. Now, reading between the lines, I think he means, I think he means, I, and, and at this point I cease to be part of the constituency under the microscope but i presume he means people who pay for private health themselves but complain about the idea of the nhs diverting some of its budget into the private sector i think that's who he means is it oh, well actually i suppose you know if you've got the option to pay 50 quid for an emergency gp operation maybe you are the sort of middle class lefty that West Streeting is talking about. But we, we'll, we'll dig into the finer detail of this a little later. He said he would ignore the howls of outrage in response to his comments because he believed the present situ- situation was a, was a disgrace. Oh, yes, and here it is. He clarifies exactly who he's talking about. Those who can afford it are paying to go private. They are being seen faster, and their outcomes and their life chances and their quality of life will be better. Um, this is following an article he wrote for the Sun newspaper, which gives you quite, a, I would have thought, quite a telling indication of precisely uh, where the direction of traffic is heading as the election approaches in, in much of Fleet Street. Um, he wrote, those who can't afford it are being left behind. Those tend to be people from working class backgrounds like mine. And then at risk of sounding a little bit like Liz Truss, he says, I think that's a disgrace. Now, obviously, some people are already benefiting themselves of policies like this. Wes Streeting's plan would involve the practice extending to a lot more people. Um, Someone I'm very close to recently had their varicose veins removed at a private clinic as an NHS patient. So it it happens. It, It is not new. Um, and therefore the question of just how much spare capacity there is is probably one to which we will have to turn. Um, but I'm interested in the politics of this as much as the policy. There are That's why, he says, as the howls of outrage pour in, 
as they already are on my social media mentions this morning, I take it as water off a duck's back. I don't think I could look someone in the eye who is waiting for months and months, sometimes over a year, in pain and agony for treatment. I couldn't look them in the eye and tell them that they should wait longer because my principles trump their timely access to care. It's powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff for a number of reasons. It's quite good politics, this, because it appeals to people who see themselves as leaning to the left, but who feel their hackles rising at the mention of middle class lefties. Uh, I, I, I guess even champagne socialist can be an insult from non-champagne socialists. What, what would they be called? I don't know, pale ale socialists, <laughs> perhaps, or baby sham socialists. So it's, I think it's quite clever politics because it's, it's West Streeting trying to sort of endear himself to people who see themselves as not particularly middle class and goodness knows we've had some conversations over the years about what middle class means or indeed what working class means i think personally it's an increasingly meaningless distinction and yet it still carries considerable political weight so he's talking about people specifically who pay for private health but don't think that the nhs should do so for patients who aren't paying extra themselves should we take a moment just to think about this there, there, there are elements of this description which do fit me chiefly the idea and i'm interested in how naive you think this sounds lambrini lefties suggests scott that's a good one i i i am interested in the notion of people making profit from providing health care now that, this is an incredibly naive position if you think that they currently don't one thing that's happened and this is not confined to the conservatives by any stretch of the imagination but the extension of more and more services that would once have been undertaken by people on the nhs payroll now being undertaken by people on a private sector company payroll has been going on for, for, for a couple of decades at least, possibly more. And if money is being diverted to people on a private sector company payroll, then somebody is also making a profit for doing nothing. This is where I do run the risk of sounding a little bit like Wolfie Smith. Well, I can't say Wolfie Smith because obviously the massive majority of people listening to this would have no idea who I'm talking about. So uh, if you don't, uh, Robert Lindsay, a magnificent, one of the greatest British actors of, 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 of recent years, uh, one of his breakthrough roles, if not his breakthrough role, was in a show called Citizen Smith where he essentially played a middle class lefty. It's an absolutely brilliant bit of television. But I was reading a mail columnist today opening a piece by talking about porridge, by talking about Ronnie Barker's character in porridge. And I just caught myself thinking, stop talking about Wolfie Smith because you're going to sound as old and out of touch as he does when he talks about porridge and, and, uh, and Norman Stanley Fletcher, isn't it? So I, I, do, I do believe that, though, and I, I think you might as well. The, the idea that the, the, the massive NHS budget should all be spent on NHS practices nhs processes nhs operations nhs treatments nhs staff if you cream some of it off and direct it to the private sector then somebody over there whose contribution to the entire process has simply been to begin it with money and to invest that money into that company providing that varicose vein removal operation at a very um uh, a pleasant looking facility not far from where i live in west london some of that money goes to somebody whose entire contribution to this process was simply having a bit of money at the beginning. He, he, he or she has never been near uh, a medical school. They have never been near uh, a, a, a varicose vein, perhaps, in any of these sort of things. That They have never been near any of these um, uh, uh, processes, and yet they will make a few quid out of that operation. And that rightly or wrongly sticks in my craw and i say rightly or wrongly because as i try to explain it to you i'm very conscious that i might sound very naive the idea that you will increase efficiency by freeing up some money at the end of the process i don't think is is completely implausible 
I mean, the stories about it costing 80 quid to change a light bulb in an NHS hospital because of the terms of the contract that was signed is not an argument against the principle of private sector contracts. It's an argument against that one. It's an argument against that contract signed by that idiot over there. But when he talks about outraging middle-class lefties, I think more broadly, I think the constituency of hypocrisy in which you'd say, oh, no, I pay to go private, but I don't think the NHS should spend its money to let you go private and therefore be seen quicker than you would otherwise be seen. I think that's a very specific constituency of hypocrisy. I think what's more interesting is the question of whether or not the idea of an NHS that is separate from the private sector has actually been dead in the water for some time now. And, and I wonder how many of us fully appreciate that. And I wonder who is best placed to help us understand it. I wonder, in fact, whether it's you. So if you work in the NHS, you, you, it's a bit like doing what I do for a living. In one way. I mean, goodness, for a, I, 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 blimey, Joseph, I'm not suggesting for a minute that I'm anywhere near as useful as you are. But in one way, you forget how interested other people might be in what it is that you do. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a job that other people find interesting. I think you'd be surprised how little we understand about how far the private sector has already infiltrated the NHS. You see, infiltrated. It's an unconscious bias there. Anybody ever wonders what unconscious bias means? There's a really good example. I use the word infiltrated. Infiltrated is a negative word. I could easily have said, I think that you'd be surprised how little most people understand about how far the private sector has already helped the NHS or, or, or um, uh, contributed to the NHS or taken up some of the slack of the NHS. There's loads of words that I could have used there. But I didn't. I said infiltrated, which gives you an indication of where my gut feeling lies on this. Um, Alex is cross. Of course, investors don't do nothing. They risk capital in exchange for potential reward. I, I'm sorry you felt the need to explain that, Alex. I'm sure everybody else listening understood. But in terms of effort in term, and, and the possibility of losing money, obviously, is true to most investments, but probably not investments in most private sector health companies that have got a guaranteed income from the NHS. But it's not, as I say, necessarily wrong. It's not necessarily a, 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 a bad practice. So what do you think? How, how committed are you this is quite a broad philosophical question I'd like you to begin with. How committed are you to an NHS that gives money to private companies to shrink waiting? Actually, let's do this really straight. We don't do this often enough. Let's not dress it up. That's the policy. We are giving NHS, so taxpayers' money that has been allocated to the NHS in order to shorten waiting lists, we're going to pay private sector companies to do some of these operations and treatments. I'm pretty close to saying what's not to like when I phrase it like that. Are you? Uh, the alternative would be to, to redirect the funds into rebuilding elements of the NHS. So there is a defeatist element to this policy. It's as if to say, sorry, the, the, the job of building new wards, building new hospitals, actually making the NHS capacity increase to the point where we don't need to pay private sector companies. West Streeting seems to think that that mountain is too steep or too high to climb. He might be right. You might know, 03456060973. But the idea, very simply, of spending NHS budget on private companies to shorten waiting lists, does it challenge you politically? Is it something you've got a problem with politically? And if so, tell me why, because I need a little bit of help on this. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 03456060973. I suspect that for most people, they don't care about the economics of it, if they're getting health care that's free at the point of care and it's going to be quicker than it would otherwise be. And then the second question is, pretty straightforward one. The second question is, what extent does the private sector already prop up the NHS? And, and you might think this is a question that doesn't need answering, but I promise you it is. To what extent does the private sector already prop up or support or infiltrate whatever word you like without us really having noticed 
So there's two questions. The broad philosophical and political question, which I really like about how important it actually is that no investors make money out of the NHS. And then the second question about how widespread is this practice already? And actually, for the hat trick, can we find a middle class lefty who's very cross about this? Because I've got a feeling that Wes Streeting, quite cynically and knowingly, is speaking about people he's fairly confident don't really exist, but who the demonization of will appeal to a certain electoral demographic. Oh, down with those middle class lefties. Yeah, I'm not one of them. I'm a lefty lefty. I'm not a middle guy. I hate those middle class. Le Who's he talking about? So are you a middle class lefty that is unhappy with this? So talk me through. There's a lot there. I hope you can unpick it. I think, I think I've been clear enough. We'll soon find out because um, if, if the questions aren't clear, you won't be queuing up to answer them. If you would like to reserve your place in the queue, the number you need is 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. I, I let you down yesterday. I had a really good example for one of the features that we come up with, pat ourselves on the back for being brilliant and then completely forget about. Um, it was this one. Unhinged headline. And as ever, we turn to the Daily Telegraph for this, yesterday's Daily Telegraph, where a former Labour MP, I kid you not, wrote re re an article under this headline, <coughs> rents aren't unaffordable. We're talking about people yesterday living in vans, all of whom had jobs, you remember? Rents aren't unaffordable. Young people just don't want to work. We should welcome rising house prices as a much-needed incentive for the work-shy generation. Tom Harris giving 30p Lee a run for his money there on the question of how the hell were you ever a Labour politician? How the hell were you ever in the Labour Party if you're possessed of toxic opinions like this? Uh, 23 minutes after 10 is the time. Questions in front of us today are the, the sort of philosophical question about private sector companies making a profit out of NHS treatments. And then the simpler logistical question of, of how much of the NHS is already propped up by, uh, in a symbiotic relationship with, infiltrated by the uh, the private sector. And can we find a middle class lefty that hates Wes Anderson? Wes Anderson? Wes Streeting's idea, please. All middle class lefties love Wes Anderson. I think we can say that with absolute confidence, but possibly not Wes Streeting. Karen's in Kingston. Karen, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, hi. Hello. I'm a middle class lefty who also well uses done. private health because we, we need to on occasion. Okay. And the first thing I'd say, it's a question of trust. I don't, the people, it's so disappointing, Wes Streeting, the people running NHS England, you poke behind the scenes and they've all got private health funding behind them. So the deputy chair of NHS England who, who you know, lay out how the health service is run, he's a, he donated many million pounds to this government. And then you get Frank Hester, who is another major um, the racist. donor. Yes, the yes, racist, the racist. Diane Abbott yeah. guy. He, yeah. He's he saddled the NHS GPs with a terrible computer system, and and well, hang on a West, minute. I, 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 I'm comfortable to to, to to push the parameters of potential libels as far as I just did, but I can't let you say Karen that. Karen Irwin, uh, blame me. Uh, no, well, you can't. You can't. I mean, I, I, you you you, oh, you, you have like heard that. or you believe this, so you can't. You, you don't have clarity. It may be that West Streeting is making a powerful case, but as long as any political parties take funding from private health companies, those political parties then speaking up for private yeah. health companies and creating oh. opportunities for private health companies can't, can't necessarily be trusted. Yes, and I think the problem is the dialogue is always about how inefficient the NHS is. And yes. as with any large organisation, that's going to have inefficiencies, especially when you've got people like this in charge of the contracts. But, for okay. example, do the public know that GP surgeries get £164 per year per patient? And why don't we know that? Because it's never put Which out Which is simply there. not enough. I mean, it, the information well, is... private... It, appointments about a hundred pounds for twenty minutes. The, the information is there, and in in our defence, we've had GPs explain that on this program. But it's mm. that old in chestnut. The media. It's an, well, like, this is the flipping media, Karen. What do you think I, I am, I, chop I, liver? My, I'm sorry. We we the people who listen to you, James, and thank God for you. That's all I'll say. The well, people who listen kind. to you. Well, honestly, what you mean is you'll read an article. The you'll, few years. Yes. Yeah, the newspapers. You'll read an newspapers. article about NHS inefficiency, and nowhere in it will it be mentioned. You're probably yeah. going to hear that old canard I just dropped about the 80 quid light bulb, but nowhere in it will you hear yeah. how much GP, how much GP funding actually costs. And, and, and yeah. before you know it, we'll be talking about all these 
people working for councils being paid a ton of money without actually talking about what their jobs might be or how difficult those jobs are or how much responsibility they carry. It's almost like there's a pattern. But I just want to pick you up personally, if I may. Yes, of course. Because everything you've said is feasible, defensible, and, and quite possibly plausible. But you are a person who is in the position, whether it's for good reasons or ill, who is currently at least in part opposed to the idea of people who have no choice but to rely upon the NHS availing themselves of some of the services that you're able to pay for privately. I think I, my question to that would be, if we put the money we give to private hospitals um, into using the facilities we have, properly stuff, yeah. I think there's been experiments recently where certain consultants have really banged into their lists at weekends yes. and um, made things work incredibly efficient. And if we could just support our hospitals, I wonder if that would be a better use of money. I mean, given, that, as I said, about what GP fundings managed to do with £164 per year per patient, are they really that inefficient? Uh, and I have no. If, if you but here's a hospital you. that's ready to go. See, this is I, if yeah. I was West Streeting, this is where I would draw lines between perhaps pragmatism and and middle class lefty principles. Here is a here is a here's, here's a hospital that's got capacity, and we can give them some of this money. Which you would say, no, you'd much be better off building a new hospital over there or building a new ward over there. So you've got a choice tomorrow. Your auntie Doris either gets a new hip or she doesn't. And if you're building a new hospital, she's going to have to wait for it to be finished before she gets a new hit, by which point she'll probably need two, or we spend it tomorrow on that private facility over there. And in the short term, maybe that's an answer. But um, But our own NHS hospitals are sitting there crumbling because of underfunding. And if they weren't crumbling and they were properly staffed, we wouldn't be in this position. By the way, hospital beds in Europe, 7.76 per thousand in Germany... 2.42 2.42 in the UK. Okay, and again, we blame yeah. the NHS for this inefficiency. What was it in 2010? No Do you know? Do you know? Clever clogs. No, I don't. So I just <laughs> the best so you're pretty good, people. though. You're pretty good. Yeah, Can I, I ask why you, you have these figures at your fingertips? Are you in the sector? Or? Yes. My right. son is a doctor okay. and my family have all been in the health service and I'm passionate about the health service. And, 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 uh, and also, you are r- fearful and of some do, of the things that streeting is, is selling. Is, is I don't trust their motivation. That's the problem. I don't trust any of their motivations. Wow. I think they've all got fingers in pies massively. Uh, I'm sorry, Frank Hester has, is a major donor. I think we can accept that. And yeah, but hey, 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 say contact. what you like about the racist Frank Hester who gave £15 million to the Tory party and hasn't faced any consequences what, whatsoever. I'm confident that there are no questions over the sale of a council house that may or may not have yielded £1,500 15 years ago. Well, this is what I mean about trust, you see. So let us bear I that in mind. trust any of if if those there is should be a, well I think there is a register of interest and if the public would like to Google members of the par, pub, uh, members of the parliament who have interest in private health I think they'd fall off their but you're right school. they would particularly the House of Lords oddly even more so than the than the House of Commons but um I, I, the, 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 that is perhaps well I know it's not a conversation for a different day it's a conversation for today and I'm glad you've raised it and in fact with, with apologies to everybody waiting to talk to Sue to Rob to Phil to Ruth to Becky to Tom to Mike and others um. I, I, I felt, Karen, just, well, as with all callers, I keep listening for as long as I'm interested. Uh, and and I was, which is why it's taken us all the way up to the very latest headlines with Thomas Watts. James O'Brien on LBC. Which song lyric do we quote most often on this programme, do you think? Do you, have you got a view? Got any thoughts? I think it's this one. I think it's don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. A Joni Mitchell lyric um, from Big Yellow Taxi of course. I wasn't expecting that to pop up today, but just as we finish Karen's call, Leslie appears on my inbox writing, I'm the grandma who choked you up because I am paying for my grandson to have his tonsils removed privately against all of my political beliefs. I honestly don't care who does these operations, James, but with a big disclaimer, I don't mind for now. And a a lesson here for Idiot's Corner applicants, Leslie uses capital letters for the word now and only for the word now, which means it assumes a special emphasis. If the whole thing was written in capital letters or if there were capital letters all over the place, they would lose all impact and meaning 
entirely. She goes on, people are living with debilitating illnesses and extreme pain. My three-year-old grandson's life is made a misery because of his tonsillitis. He's been out once during the two-week Easter holidays. The rest of the time he has been too ill. We cannot carry on like this. Just do whatever it takes for now, and then we can get the NHS sorted in due course. To which I think Karen would respond by pointing out that West Streeting doesn't ever say much about the second bit of that project. And I, very lazily, would quote Joni Mitchell again. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone? They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. The point being, because it probably needs explaining, the point being that if they've put up the parking lot, you can't build paradise. And the private sector here is the parking lot and the uh, Bevan, Bevanite NHS is paradise. Becky is in Oxford. Becky, what would you like to say? Hi, yeah, um, I completely, hi, I completely agree with that um, email that you've just read out in terms of, um, I'm an NHS worker, I see a lot of private companies being used on a daily basis in the yes. organisation that I work for, completely agree, it's needed for now, but this, we're talking about extremely short term, and long term what we need is a highly functioning um, NHS that can do the job that it's designed to do, and unfortunately under this government, we haven't been supported or allowed to do that hence why we're in the position that we're in now uh, and, and there, there it is actually isn't that amazing <laughs> two calls in Very and we've simple. got to the absolute nub of it the absolute nub of it which is yes i can be supportive of this even if i am uh, a middle class lefty but not if it means the structural improvements and the, the the undoing of the damage done in particular since 2010 is never properly addressed Every, everything just how how I mean, I don't know if you can answer this, Ruth, or if you want to have a go, but how confident can we be that the, uh, that the NHS loses money by pushing business in the direction of, of a private sector company? Because if it doesn't lose money, if the private sector manages to do it for, for the same price or less than it would cost in the NHS, then the argument that nothing should be creamed off the top and making its way to investors becomes a little harder to sustain. My impression is we, we do lose money and we certainly lose uh, we lose efficiency by doing it that way. Yeah. Um, so we certainly lose money because we have to be competitive because we're paying in for that, you know, we're buying that service in. Yes. Um, the, real, the, the real sting in the tail with it is that, of course, when things go wrong, we then have you to come pick back up the to pieces the NHS. in the NHS. Yeah. <laughs> you come back to your ED, you come back to our ITU if someone's deteriorated in a private hospital and they don't have an intensive care unit. Mm. You come back if that's it, if there's been secondary complications with that surgery and they have to come back to the NHS to, to fix it. Um, so it's certainly not an efficient way. Um, but yeah. but it is but it is the only the only way that we can to shorten make waiting sure lists at the moment exactly. to, to, to address exactly. these back these epic backlogs. So I I, I'm, yeah. I I used to be I'd be interested in again final question I promise I used to be a little bit dismissive certainly sceptical of arguments that this was a deliberate political if you like de, de dilution diminishment of the NHS in order to create opportunities for uh, private sector companies. Uh, as the years have passed since David Cameron became Prime Minister, my scepticism has dissipated slightly. Mm. Do, what do you think? Um, no, my, I'm still very sceptical. Yeah. I, I, I graduated and have been working in the NHS since 2003. Gosh. And I cannot tell you, in 2003, it, 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 it was a really fantastic place to work and still is with fantastic people but we we looked after people we had really really excellent care high quality we had systems that cared about what we were delivering yeah. at the at the moment what we do is we are getting given targets that are, that the government know is impossible to reach the way that the money comes through means it's impossible to spend in the right places in the right way we have a social system that isn't supported and so the healthcare system ends up having to support in a way that it's not designed to do um so no i'm highly skeptical and i think no you mean you're, you know, you're 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 not you 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 believe it is deliberate by the yeah, conservative 100%, government to create 100%. opportunities for for, for their 100%. mates like Frank Hester, the well-known racist. Yeah, because no one can be that silly, um, and it, it's very visible. Yeah. Well, no I used to think no. Well, I used to think we were crediting them with too much cleverness, 
But I think yeah. your no one can be that silly, no one can have done this by accident argument is possibly yeah. even stronger than my, they're not that clever because you don't really have to be that clever to run stuff down in order to give massive contracts to your mates who in return will give you 15 million quid and then call for Diane Abbott to be killed. 10.38 is the time. Woof. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, thank you, Becky. I beg your pardon. Ruth is in Gateshead. Ruth, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, it's just leading on from what she's saying there. It's um, what I also disagree with is the unfair distribution of patient types yes. um, between the NHS and the private sector. Um, for example, your friends say with the varicose veins, um, <laughs> it, 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 there's a finite cost per operation what the government gives. Um, so, say for example, that cost about a thousand pound. A patient who was fit, healthy otherwise um, would um, get a £1,000 to have var varicose veins removed in a private hospital and be dis discharged the same day. The NHS um, tend to look after the patients who maybe have obesity, type 2 diabetes. Why is this a problem? History. Just, just, just um, Let me just adjust my devil's advocate hat, Ruth, OK? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just asking questions. Why, why is that a problem? Why shouldn't the easy, self-contained procedures be undertaken in a sort of conveyor belt private sector scenario while the complicated multidisciplinary procedures come back into which which have uh, you know no easily identifiable costs because you don't know where the journey is going to end they come back into the nhs it, it's the money thing um the um, the private sector would get exactly the same amount of money to look after the, the, the patient with no underlying health conditions as the nhs would get to look after the patient who would probably need a longer stay more support um, a day in intensive care after but then, surgery. We, well, then we can address that though can't we it, it, so it, it but until it's addressed, there's going to be an un unfair distribution of money. I'm being, I'm so be I, don't, I don't think I'm being obtuse. So here are two patients, right? Yeah. They've both got underlying health conditions. Both of them have. Yeah, both of them have. Right. One goes into an NHS hospital to get their varicose veins done. One goes into a private hospital. The other one wouldn't go into the private hospital. That's the point. The, the private hospital wouldn't take wouldn't it, take the one with the underlying health condition. All right, I'm no. still I'm still not sharing your concerns because it, 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 it's it's the distribution because they both get treated. Was, yes, the patient. It, it's great for the patients. They right. both get treated. They both leave happy. Um, however, the NHS will have. Um, absorbed a cost far greater than what the private sector pay, um, would have, yeah. but they would have both been paid the same amount of money. So as a result, the NHS has, has had a loss uh, for Because that of the way the funding is structured in yes. the NHS. Uh -huh. They would get exactly the same amount of okay. money for those patients. One would probably be discharged that afternoon. The other one would need a night in intensive care with all of the staff and equipment that goes. Okay, I, 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 I feel... A, I, I, it's as if your point is just just out of focus for me I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not questioning you anymore you're obviously onto something but it's just a tiny bit out of focus for me until I think that it's the funding model that is the problem here and, and you can't really change the funding model because if I'm promising to do 500 varicose vein operations every month for a fixed fee then I can't really sign up to doing it if there are likely to be complications with those 500 if you, if you looked at it that way, then, if you looked at a hotel, for example, yeah. you can stay room only, you can stay bed and breakfast, yes. you can stay all-inclusive. Um, so why aren't patients looked at in the same respect? Um, your room only patients, basic cost, your yes. bed and breakfast, slightly more, and the ones who are wanting an all-inclusive package. And so a patient would get a full pre-assessment done prior to the operation where you would anticipate what their needs were. Right. And therefore, you could see this patient two grand and not a grand. So you know, your problem, your problem here, is with the principle, is with the practice rather than the principle, the practice and the practicalities rather than the principle of farming work out to the private sector. I, I, I loathe farming work and um, yeah. work out to the private but. sector. Um, but I know <laughs> it, 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 again, it's it, it's a needs most at the minute. It's um, it's kind of use it. Until we get the waiting list down. Yeah, but that's what, that, now, that, now that's what's scaring me, is that we'll, we'll, we'll say we'll use it until we get the waiting list down, but, but it will just become the new normal. We'll have built a parking lot and paved over paradise. But thank you for being so patient with me, Ruth. We, we, we got there in the end. Um, and, and that was a big but. And quite a few have pointed out that there is some competition for my claim that that Joni Mitchell lyric from The Big Yellow Taxi is the most used lyric on this programme. And in fact, is it Sir Mix-a-Lot? 
who likes big butts and cannot lie. That that is definitely up there with the with the song lyrics we reference most often. And if you haven't seen it yet, and you are even mildly close to me in terms of age and stroke or background, then if you haven't watched the one day drama on Netflix, you are in for such a treat. Honestly, it is absolutely ext- it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. The performances are off the charts. And and Sir Mix a lot got a mention in the episode that I was catching up with last night. I, I, it's, I don't know why a, a public school educated university graduate who dabbled around in uh, in television without great success should be of such enormous interest to me. Uh, but but also someone who was very heavily involved in rave culture and it just just touches a lot of nerves. But even if it doesn't touch any personal nerves, I think you find it, it it's it's a thing of absolute beauty. And I could see the big butt coming there w- w- with Ruth. You you I absolutely loathe farming out work to the private sector. But everyone so far broadly agrees with Wes Streeting that we have to do it now. The problem becomes with the next bit of that sentence, which is as long as we redirect resources, because what are you going to do with all those hospitals that are doing the 500 varicose vein operations a month? What happens to them? Uh, Do do you see what I mean? You can't requisition them. It's not sort of Stalinist Russia. So there are, I think, problems here. Uh, It's coming up to quarter to 11. And also, I'm not going to contextualize the next comment, uh, but um, uh, Kat's been in touch to say... I. uh, 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 I vote for Shaggy. It's 10.45. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.48 is the time. David in Inverness writes, I'm extremely sceptical about the alleged spare capacity in the private healthcare sector. Which, of course, is what West Streeting will rely on or is relying on to address waiting lists in the NHS. David goes on, where are the workforce who are going to ramp up the private sector capacity? Surely they're not sitting around fiddling. It's twiddling, isn't it? Twiddling their thumbs on the private payroll at present. Staffing is a major issue, be it private or public sector. I'll tell you what I'd do, Dave. Give him a ring. He's on with Sheila at one o'clock today. I hadn't realised when we started this conversation this morning, but West Streeting's on with Sheila at one o'clock this morning, and that would be my first question too. Get in there early. Ask him, where, 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 what, what is this spare capacity doing now, West Streeting? What's it doing right now, all this spare capacity? Because if it's in the NHS, well, then get them to do the work. And if it's in the private sector, then these companies aren't being very well run, are they? If there's a spare capacity, doctors and, and this might actually not be the zinger that I think it is and that Dave, I think, thinks it is. But I, I can't currently see why it isn't. Just as I couldn't neatly see the last caller's point with regard to what's known as cherry picking patients. Thankfully, corpses on hand to, to clarify it for me, at least. You may not need it clarifying. He writes, metrics are incredibly important, James. The NHS is taking emergency or complicated patients while the private sector takes the simple ones, but they are being judged and funded as if all patients are identical. Measure by patient and the NHS is not efficient. Measure by hour and the results will be different. That's almost a poem, that second bit. I, and that's the point, isn't it, that perhaps we've learned more. Or I, that's been the biggest learning point for me today. Uh, yeah, you're right. It, it answers the question of which song lyrics do we quote most often on the programme. Marvin Gaye certainly gets a look in, as does Shaggy. But Rich Man in His Castle, Poor Man at His Gate, as Sam Stevenson and many others have suggested, that could actually be even more popular than the Joni Mitchell lyric. Uh, the Rich Man in His Castle, The Poor Man at His Gate, God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. I don't know if you were listening when I stumbled across that on air. But rarely have I had a moment of such penny-dropping significance as I did when we realised that that was something we used to sing at school. The idea that it's perfectly not just normal, but ordained by the God Almighty himself, that people should, with epic wealth, should sit alongside people without a pot to pee in. If you're very good today, I'll tell you where that figure of speech comes from. I read it yesterday in a, in a book I'm reading. 10 to 11 is the time. Janet's in Dawlish in Devon to steer us back to the NHS conversation. Janet, what would you like to say? I, I was just, I rang up to, to mm. say that I've had experience of both private and NHS. I don't, I'm absolutely 100% for the NHS, but I realise that we have got to get this 8 million, pa- million queue of people yes. seen to. Yes. And if, if, a short-term measure of going into the private sector um, 
will do it. I, I, I just feel we've absolutely got to. But where, and, where's I mean, the spare I, capacity, you see, Janet? Yeah, this well, is... but there seems to be. I mean, around here, we've got a huge elderly population. Yes. And it's hips and knees. I mean, I'm, a friend of mine's got had two hips, two knees, and she's now had an ankle. You know, done. And and all about this an orthopedic. Ankle. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Another friend's just about waiting to have one done. She's like robo um, pensioner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, but, um, the local private hospital, which seems to get a lot of this NHS work, they also have private, obviously, have private patients. Mm. And I have been visiting both private patients in there oh, and yes. NHS patients. And the NHS patients don't get the frills that the no. private patients get that my friend had a hit in the same there. hospital in the same hospital okay. in a, I can live a with minute that. room yes. a minute room um and the food was at was fine she said it was fine but um another friend who was pr- paying privately was having a you know off- offer of a gin and tonic roast before. swan yeah well not quite <laughs> but you know what i mean <laughs> i yeah. do know what um, you mean so, yes so, so i think that's fine i i think that's i think fine yes i think uh, absolutely fine um and i think nobody uh, all the people I know who have had um, an NHS procedure in these private hospitals all say they're quite happy with that. You but know, but the, what we don't know is, you see, this is the point Dave makes, and David Oliver, who, who who tweets as Mancunian medic and is is very very helpful in NHS related issues, he he's actually made the same point. A few people have just brought this to my attention. That there is a mystery regarding the question of what this spare capacity that Streeting speaks of is currently doing, because. Could I suggest to you that when you visit your friends in these hospitals, in this hospital, there aren't like corridors of empty rooms? No, that's true. Yeah, they're full to the they're full to that. the rafters, aren't they? Well, I'm not, I don't know, but I know okay. people who go privately do get seen quite quickly. <laughs> they're not they're not waiting six months or a year or no, two but years. The, but the spare capacity that that currently exists would mean that there are people currently yeah. doing nothing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Or am I being silly? <laughs> Well, I don't know. Nor I, do I, I think a lot Nor of the, do I, 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 know, I don't. I mean, most of the most of the medical staff in these private hospitals are NHS staff, aren't they? Who who work? Yes, usually. And, so um, more my, more might do that. So at the moment, around half of consultants do zero private practice. So yeah, some of well, them may may move across and start doing a little bit. So yeah, it's relying yeah. on existing NHS yeah, doctors. I think so. Doing more. And nurses. Well, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see how he answers this question, which I think someone will most certainly ask him when he pops up with Sheila Fogarty at one o'clock today. Can I just say that you sound lovely going to visit your friends as as if it's quite a big part of your routine. (laughs) What a lovely thing. It's not really, but I'm, I'm yeah. Uh, and my husband was in um, hospital for a long time. And um, I used, uh, and so I, I sort of, kept my eyes open when I go into these places. Oh, how helpful. And I recently just had a very minor, minor, minor procedure in my mouth. Okay. And I was on the NHS waiting list for two years. Go on. And you waited. <laughs> you waited the two years. I waited. I was determined to wait. Because and, you're um, a middle-class lefty. They, because you are a yeah, middle-class lefty. Yeah. I am definitely a middle-class lefty. And when, I, and when I actually got a phone call to say um, I could have it done in February, I said, I was busy, and I said, could I have it done in March? And they said, no, you've got to have it done in February. <laughs> you're such a troublemaker, <laughs> Janet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can, can have it done in No, you blooming well can't. You'll have it done in February. Thank you, Janet. Lots there. Uh, Nick's in Hackney. Nick, do you know why I am mildly disappointed to see you on my switchboard? <laughs> no, I can't imagine. Because I, it think, I haven't got a song for you. I, I, no, it's not that. I think that you are preventing us from having done an entire hour with only female calls. I think. We didn't take a male call that hour, did we? And that's all. So it's just me being a bit weird and, and defying the uh, diktat that phone-in programmes aren't popular with, with, with women. But here you are. And you are very, very welcome, Nick. Thank you. And a particularly good bunch of calls. Uh, they were, I weren't think. they? Yeah, they are. Don't um, fluff it up, mate. <laughs> um you know, West Streeting is yes. playing a, a slightly sneery um, idea. You know, it's yes. all about ideology. Um, and in fact, the arguments against the private sector and privatisation are very much in, in the real realm. Um, mm. it's talking about middle class lefties, is he talking about the people who are scraping their savings together in the sun? You yes. know, the yes. people who are yeah using up their child benefit in order to pay for their mum's operation. I, you know, I dread to think what he's talking about but actually using that as an argument against very real arguments about why increasing the private sector in a one you know we got one chance at this 
And if we screw this up, we won't get a second go. Uh, In 2003, Labour did a good thing. Okay, they did a good thing. They managed to get rid, they managed to get down the waiting list. But if you look at the parliamentary record, the waiting lists were achieved by the NHS not by increases in the independent sector treatment centres. So it's a kind of, it's a false dichotomy that you're saying, oh, well, we did it then through the private sector. Well, we didn't, actually. It was bumping up the NHS that did that. And, in you know, in COVID, there was two billion spent on on the private sector, which did very, very little. Well, a lot of it was spent on securing capacity that wasn't actually needed wasn't it in the in the in the exactly what what exactly. perspective and do you speak from nick and if i could just establish that i'm a doctor for of 34 right. years um I i've been so. a patient unfortunately yeah. uh you know six months ago and i can see some really worrying changes um we need to you know the the problems in the nhs are basic they are about 14 years worth of reduced funding um beds uh, doctors per patient nurses per patient etc etc that that is the record that's the authoritative record that says why the nhs is in such a dire state um and if we you know there are only 8000 beds in the private sector there's a limited pool that limited pool comes from the nhs the private sector don't train doctors no. they don't have uh, largely they don't have things like uh, intensive care units um they take off at least 20 percent margins um which is just money lost immediately to the pool of the nhs they don't deal with uh, s- severe cases they don't deal with the complex cases they deal with the easy stuff but um, n- none of this is an argument against it being a short-term fix to the current waiting list problem but you don't think that washes either or you've only you? got if you've got double running because then we're back to the spare capacity question aren't we which seems to be yeah. running through this like blackpool through a stick of rock now where, where, where is the spare capacity currently do you think if if, if anywhere well there is a, there is some capacity in doctors there there will be some capacity in a state which is you know there's a okay. lot of state that's been mothballed right. um, and there's only a limited capacity in the private sector so what they're looking at doing is building private sector beds and building PFI we don't want to do that we've only got one pool of money it, and, we want, and we want to spend as much as is humanly possible on the NHS. The problem we both have with that, because it, I think it appeals to my political instincts as well, is that it won't get um, that lad's tonsils removed quickly or, or, or that ankle replaced or that hip replaced. And, and there it is. Like, that, I think, is missing from West Streeting's analysis. So I hope it's something that is brought up when he joins Sheila after one o'clock today. Uh, that, that while this may well be welcome in the short term, if indeed it's feasible and, and, and um, plausible, what does it mean for the long term? Are you um, paving over paradise and building a parking lot? Because right now we really need a parking lot. I think that works quite well. It would obviously sound a bit partridgey if you just tuned in, but hopefully you haven't. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11. This only works if you were listening to the last closing moments of the last hour. Carl's been in touch to say, I've just tuned in, James. You sound very like Alan Partridge today. You think I sound like Alan Partridge. Wait until you meet Andrew. Andrew's texted, James, that was Big Yellow Taxi by Joni Mitchell, a song in which Joni complains that they paved over paradise to put up a parking lot, a measure which actually would have alleviated traffic congestion on the outskirts of paradise, something which Joni singularly fails to point out, perhaps because it doesn't quite fit in with her blinkered view of the world. Hmm. Nevertheless, nice song. Aha. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Okay, we're one next 100 percent experience i think I, I i could be wrong i often am but i don't think this one lends itself to any sort of meta overviews or philosophical uh extrapolations gordon brown is calling and others are calling upon keir starmer to put a new sure start style program at the heart of his election manifesto now yesterday we commented didn't we upon how the health department had earmarked, I think, 300 million quid to to help people be better parents. 
And for some of my generation, some of the news was quite hard to swallow because it involves the polar opposite of what many of us were taught back in the day, which was to let children cry out, as it were, to let them uh, 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 learn almost to soothe themselves, to leave a crying baby in the cot and and to hug them less. And the advice coming from the health service is to encourage parents to hug their children more. And... In the course of that conversation, which went in some, ext- I'm doing it. Have you caught me saying X and then stopping myself? You had to be, you had to be listening. Was it on Monday that I coughed to this, or, or was it at the end of last week? I can't remember, but uh, I think it was the end of last week. I, I, I caught myself saying the word extraordinary. Shivani Sheila's producer has, has, has turned it into a slightly embarrassing recurring theme i say extraordinary because i love the word so much i nearly said it earlier when i was talking to you about one day i said it's an ex it's a beautiful television drive i've got to stop saying extraordinary so much i'm turning into some sort of caricature but we did in the course of our conversation yesterday which took a, a, a remarkable turn <laughs> caught myself just and started instead addressing the question of of grown-ups who had been denied affection by their parents by their otherwise loving parents i think that was the crucial element of that conversation you know and and i don't know where that came from just that idea that we don't want today to examine the grim the grimmest of the grim stories we we want to address the the plight almost of parents who clearly love their children but can't show it or can't say it or or, or can't articulate it through a hug and and therefore the conversation ended up going in directions that I don't think any of us were expecting and there were some moments if you missed the program there were some moments of true beauty true and, and considerable beauty but I did find myself mentioning Sure Start a couple of times <clears throat> because I think it is widely regarded as one of the unqualified successes of the Labour government it was a very much a brainchild of Gordon Brown he was Chancellor in 1998 when it was announced. And the Conservative government, the coalition government initially, followed by the Conservative government, set about di- dismantling it almost within moments of getting into Downing Street, which was such a stupid and unpleasant thing to do. It was such a narrow and desiccated thing to do. This idea that we must cut spending, what on? Babies. That's Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown. That's George Osborne. For what we need to cut spending? Why? Blah, reasons. Well, what are you going to cut spending on? Babies. R- really? You're going to start with babies? Yes. Less money for babies. Less money for parents. Gordon Brown puts it rather more maturely than I just managed to. He says the willful destruction of Sure Start and the reductions of children's benefits after 2010 has set back opportunities for millions of children's futures. That's why our country desperately needs a new sure start. And three former Labour Education Secretaries have added their voices to this call, including David Blunkett, who said a reinvention of the policy was, and I quote, crucial for the well-being of so many young people in the years to come. I, I don't know if you know what they were. I, 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 there was one near us, actually, and that's quite interesting because you used to tease me for saying that I lived on an estate. This is two houses ago for us when my oldest was born, and she's, she's 18 now. She's off to university, I think, later this year. Uh, and, and there was one on our... You used to tease me when I said I lived on an estate, because, but I did live on an estate. I lived on, a, on an estate built at the, the back end of the 19th century for, for workers, for artisans, for sort of craftsmen. And it had been social housing, but it was in the city of Westminster, so an awful lot of the social housing had passed into the private sector, but an awful lot of it hadn't. So you had the original 19th century estate, but you also had the Mozart estate, which had some very unhappy statistics attached to it at the time cheek by jowl next to the estate where some some of the property uh, quite a lot of the property had made its way into the private sector through the council health set-off scheme and had subsequently ended up being quite uh valuable property so you had you had middle class lefties and righties and middleies You had relatively or comparatively well-off middle-class professionals living alongside 
people who were still in social housing and were not uh, were not in in receipt of comparable incomes and that's why we had a sure start center because they were deliberately targeted on disadvantaged areas and what they would do would be like provide a one-stop shop where health and family support services could be accessed under a single roof. Now, I remember now one of the arguments used to justify their destruction. And I've just, in a way, proved the pertinence, that the limited pertinence of the point, because the claim was that they were infiltrated, if you like, or, or, or um, occupied by people who weren't disadvantaged. Now, I have to be careful how I choose my words now because I, 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 I mentioned in the last hour, very conscious of class on this programme, but suspicious of some of the ways in which politicians use the distinctions. But I think that might be part of the reason why they were so successful. I, I think that everybody benefits from diversity. I think that people who sit quite high upon the socio-economic ladder benefit from diversity when they encounter and, and share experiences and break bread with people who are below them on the socio-economic ladder. And I also think, and this is where I'm not qualified to comment and I run the risk of sounding a bit patronising, but in for a penny, eh? I think that people who are a bit lower down the socio-economic ladder also benefit from breaking bread with and sharing experiences with and accessing the same spaces as people who hire up the socioeconomic ladder. And I think that's why the analysis published today shows that the benefits to children who lived in areas where there were sure starts and therefore are um, or had access to sure starts, the benefits are almost unbelievable. Uh, you're looking at GCSE results being boosted by three grades. So it's the difference between getting two C's and three D's and getting five C's. And what they've done is compare children from a poorer background who did have access to a Sure Start Centre to children from a poorer background who didn't have access to a Sure Start Centre. And you've got three GCSEs grades worth of difference. The effect got greater as more centres were set up. So it, 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 it was prior to 2003 when they had bigger budgets and, and more successful outreach programmes that they really started kicking ass. And it increased the prevalence of support for special educational needs children. And that, of course, picked up and addressed early some of the problems that right-wing pundits and commentators like to pretend they care about when they're looking for an excuse to punch the unlucky and denigrate the poor. So you, you just got in early with education, health and care plans. Gordon Brown says today, and you know, I'm often asked, which I have interviewed Gordon Brown. He, he came on the show once when, when he was prime minister. It wasn't a happy experience for me. I, I didn't get, I, I, was, I was quite green, quite wet behind the ears. And I, I wanted to reach the man behind the politician. And he, and he was here for 10 minutes. I didn't get close. I, I'd love to get him on full. If you know him, would you tell him? I'd love to get him on full disclosure. I, 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 just, I think he's the most undervalued uh, and, and misrepresented politician of the modern era. And this would be one of the main reasons why. He says, the results tell us in detail what most parents already know, that if you provide a supportive environment to children in their early years and invest their, in their futures, the results will be life transforming. And uh, I was determined, he adds, after 1997 to create Sure Start to do just that. So we are doing a very straight phone-in now, upon which I rely entirely on you, in which I rely entirely upon you for evidence. Because what they've managed to do, and, and correctly, is assemble an awful lot of statistical support for the value of the Sure Start Centres. And few things are more powerful than the idea of improving the life chances of children from the poorer backgrounds. But my daughter went to a Sure Start Centre as well, and, and I think it was good for her. 
I don't know that it would have impacted on her GCSE results, but I think it was great for her to, to, to play with kids that she wouldn't ordinarily have encountered if her social circle had been confined to the children of her parents' established friends. I know it was great for, for my wife, who, who, who would take her to the Short Start Centre, because she made friends in the area where we lived, uh, some of whom were, were not from similar sort of socioeconomic backgrounds to us. And, and it was really, really nice. It was probably one of the things we missed most when we moved quite far away in order to be able to afford a bigger house. We'd love to have been able to have stayed in that area in a bigger house, but it sadly wasn't to be. And I just want to know why. Okay. So access to a centre improved academic performance through both primary and secondary school, but the impact was most pronounced among children from low-income and minority ethnic backgrounds. All pupils who lived near and had access to a centre for their first five years performed better at GCSE than those further away, but when you come to children eligible for free school meals, that boost went up by three grades. So that's the only measure that we are using. But there will be others. And I just want you now, and it might seem like a, a simplistic question, but I don't think that it is, because for the record, I think that Gordon Brown is 156% right about this. I don't think it's any coincidence at all that he's backed by David Blunkett and, and Alan Johnson. The Shadow Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson, has made the right noises, but she has not necessarily committed to what Gordon Brown wants her to commit to. Gordon Brown and the others want her to commit to. So my question for you, as you can probably tell, is what difference did Short Start make to you? Which you've probably thought about before. 03456060973. And what difference did it make to your baby? What difference did a Sure Start Centre make to your baby? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. I, I couldn't quite believe the alacrity and the speed with which the Tories set about dismantling this. I think they probably removed the funding, didn't they? Which meant that the councils could no longer do it. Or, or, or I, but, but now, seeing what we've seen. In 2024, would you really, <laughs> in 2010, have sat on your hands and given the Tories the benefit of the doubt about this? Absolutely extraordinary. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm allowed to say it once or twice per show. But they did. They, uh, they blew it up. We may, if there's time, get onto the political question of why. Why would the Tories have such a problem with something so obviously good? But in order to do that, we've got to establish how obviously good it was. Ready? What difference did the Sure Start Centre make to you? And remember, you are speaking to people who will have no idea. That's why I did such a long explainer. 03456060973. And crucially, what difference do you think they made to your baby? I'm just looking at the numbers now. So if they started in 1998, 12, 20, 36, you may even be able to answer the question from a not a parental point of view, which is who the first question was directed at. What difference did it make to you as a parent? But actually, you may be able to tell me what difference it made to you as a baby. What difference it made to you as the person you are today who was the child in the Sure Start environment. So there's three potential constituencies. You tell me about yourself, you tell me about your child, or you tell me about yourself as a parent, you tell me about yourself as a child, or you tell me about your child. The question remains the same for all three of you. What difference did your Sure Start Centre make in your life? It's 11.18. James O'Brien on LBC. 21 minutes after 11 is the time. As Gordon Brown and uh, other uh, big beasts of new labour, as it was known, call for Keir Starmer to resurrect Sure Start, to, to bring back the Sure Start Centres that the, the Tories... Um, set about dismantling and destroying with uh, with unseemly relish. What difference did they make to you? Let's start in Durham. Harry's there. Harry, what made you pick up the phone? Hey, James, Hello. I'll tell you what made me pick up the phone. You're uh, whistling my tune with this one. Um, <laughs> many years ago, I decided to uh, have a career change. I was a hard-bitten journalist like yourself for well, many years. Soft-bitten. I saw case. a job advertised. Yes. I didn't really know what the job was was but it sounded interesting 
And as I say, I wanted a change, a complete yeah. change. Yeah. Uh, it was for an extended schools manager running a, a cluster of schools in a former mining area in County Durham. Right. As part of that role, I was involved in the management of a shoe start centre. Okay. What I saw, uh, transformative was a word used earlier. Yes. I would say it was greater than that. Really? It was, ab- yeah. James, as I said to your producer, I bored mates of mine <laughs> rigid with this over the years <laughs> about the stuff that I saw. Well, go on, bore Could us. You, not, not, don't bore us too rigid, but bore us a bit rigid. Look, I, I, a just example. Yes. Um, I put on these uh, cookery classes in, in coordination with the primary care trust, who I got to pay for it all, uh, so it didn't come out of my budget. Uh, we put on adult cooking classes. Yes. Now, being a cynical journalist, even though I was told that they would be great and they would really work and hit the spot, I was dead cynical about it and sure. thought, probably like yourself, Everybody can cook. Yeah, maybe. One of the first things that happened, somebody told me, a mate of mine who who ran a chain of stores, that a girl had come into his shop regularly buying frozen chips. Yeah. Who didn't know that frozen chips actually came from potatoes. Yeah. Right? Wow. So we put on these we put on these cookery classes, I mean they were just, I think we ran them over six weeks or eight weeks or something like that. We had waiting lists of people wanting to go on them. They used to come in, uh, say predominantly young mums, sure. and cook relatively simple stuff like spaghetti bolognese, yeah. chili con carne, stuff like that. A uh, couple of hours later, they would proudly trot out the door, carrying the, the stuff that they've made to take home for the families. It was just, I mean... And that's just one example. What, what, what? That is just one example. Childcare we, was another thing. You think, that, you think that mothers can naturally look after children? Can they hell? Well, and we, all, the statist, all the statistics show this. Um, if nobody shows you how to do something, if you haven't had a family support network yes. to show you how to be a mother, well, well how are you going to do it? Because... You know, you, you, without sounding disparaging of, of, of this. No, you people, don't. You clearly gonna, don't. You you're clearly not going to read it up, are you? You, 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 you can't just, be, you, you can't be yeah. what you can't see. Exactly. Exactly. So there was things like that. Um, it was, I mean, I could, I could go on forever. There was just so many examples. Educational attainment, you, you mentioned. Yes. So you're, you're one of the uh, I, least surprised people listening today, then, by this, this GCSE results being well, boosted by three grades or, or, or equivalent. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely not, because my main role as this extended schools manager was I had a, a large secondary school, which was the main school, and then I think it was, I think it was nine, nine, eleven, something like that, uh, feeder schools, uh, primary feeder schools within the, within the cluster. Right. And so I saw it in all of them. It wasn't just... Do you, know, you remember where you were? Did, were you still in post when they started closing them down? When, or, or, no, or, or you no, weren't, you'd was, moved I was on? on a, I was on a fixed-term contract. Initially, it was two years. They found some funding to extend it for another six months. So that was when the funding was drying up. Right. So I lasted... I lasted another six months, uh, and then I was gone, and then they started to decline after that. The building's still there. I sometimes cycle past the uh, the building. But, yeah, take it, take it from me, James. I will, I, mean, I will. A, I, well, I, don't, I don't need to I'm take a, it just from you. People are queuing up to add to, add, add yeah, to this. But, the, yeah. I mean, it makes the... And actually, people clearly know a lot of people who were involved in the system, just as, just as as you were, Harry, but also people involved in the resistance of George Osborne and Michael Gove's plans to to close it down. Um, uh, what, what one Twitter correspondent never right pointing out that they pretended at first that it was being protected and then started to shift the rhetoric. And I think part of the rhetoric shift involved claims that it was being hijacked or or, or, or sort of bandwagoned by middle class. 
mums. Um, speaking of middle class mums, David Cameron's own mum, I think, complained bitterly when they closed two short starts in Oxfordshire. I, I, I don't, you see, I, I'm normally a bit wary of not conspiracy theories, but the, the reference to Margaret Thatcher apparently insisting that we need a sort of underclass to do the jobs that would otherwise be farmed out to China. And, and therefore, this became a sort of Thatcherite project to deliberately denude poorer children or if you prefer working class children of of the means by which they might advance themselves i don't know anymore whether or not it's right to be cynical and skeptical about that i've changed a bit over the last few years alma writes sure start save my life james i suffered with a horrible postnatal depression that took me into a very dark period of my life sure start provided counseling for myself for months and helped with childcare, whilst i was attending Weekly sessions. This was um, in 2001 in Hartlepool, not too far from Harry. Mary is um, in uh, Morecambe in Lancashire. Mary, what made you pick up the phone? Uh, because I think a Shaw Start Centre saved my daughter's life. Good Lord. Really. Go on. Um, well, she was isolated from family for you know for geographical reasons. Right. Um, and had a baby. Um, and for biological was... reasons. <laughs> <Cheers>. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> that's <is> where. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> um, but um, she had one of these babies that just did not sleep. He was wakeful all the time, very demanding of time, very, well, very difficult baby. Yes. And she was, as I say, she was isolated. Uh, the Shaw Start Centre she went to gave her a bit of respite, um, helped her to understand what was going on, gave her some time. Um, her baby was later diagnosed about five years later with um, with autism. Right. But she was just she was looking round at her friends, and they were going for coffee mornings with yes. their babies, and they're all sitting there, all happy, smiling. She was at the end of her tether. She had no sleep. She was worn out. She was exhausted by this baby. She was scared. Why was she feeling this way? Oh. All her friends were okay. Why? Why is she like this? Poor thing. Um, and she went into severe depression. And I honestly believe that had it not been for the Sure Start Centre that was there supporting her, I do not think she'd be alive today. Mary, what an amazing thing to say. We're, we're, and, and at risk of sort of asking a slightly rhetorical question, if this was happening now, where would she turn, do you think? I don't think there is anywhere now. I don't now. think there is either. There isn't, there isn't anywhere now, and you know, there's, there's not even mental health services she could have got to have got support, because there's, there's queues for those. I don't, yeah... I'm glad it's it such a it mad. I mean, I, I think of all the things we failed to properly notice, the egregiousness of it was probably the assault upon sure starts that's near the top of the list. Some of it was more obvious, wasn't it? It was more front and centre, universal credit and and, and attacks upon the uh, the welfare system, the welfare state, and the NHS. But this, this, I mean, you wouldn't believe the state of my inbox. It, it, it was almost as if they took away a national treasure and and expected us to celebrate it. Do you know, Mary, on a lighter note, do you know, well, actually, I suppose your daughter's survival is a happy story, isn't it? It's, it's, <laughs> yes, do, do, yes. do you know my Morecambe story? I've got one Morecambe-based no, anecdote. On, Have you never heard it before? Me. So no, when, I, when I started at private school, uh, I, I was about seven years old, and we came back from the summer holidays. So mm-hmm. I'd be about eight by now. And all, all, all the other lads had gone to places like Lanzarote, and yeah. one lad yeah. had even gone to Barbados and mm-hmm. got to Marbella and places like that. Mm-hmm. And my dad told me to tell everyone at my new posh school that I'd been to Morricambi. Right, yes, yes. <laughs> because we'd been to Morecambe. And, it's, mm-hmm. uh, and the teacher looked at me as if I'd lost, lost, lost my marbles completely. But I've, in my mind, whenever I see Morecambe on my screen, I always, <laughs> hear my, Morecambe. I always hear my dad's voice saying we had a lovely, telling we had a lovely fortnight in Morecambe. Morecambe, he said it in an Italian accent. Oh, so, I love that. So there we are. Happy days. Thank you, uh, Mary. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.32, and uh, I talked, didn't I, earlier about a massive penny drop moment. I think we've got another one here. Uh, James, I feel as though the scales have been lifted from my eyes regarding the Sure Start issue. As a teacher of some 27 years, working in disadvantaged secondary schools, I have seen support dwindle, and as a result, our children and parents are really struggling. I am now seeing students coming through who did not receive any Sure Start support, and I'm convinced that this has a massive impact on them, and equally importantly, their parents. 
Parents now don't have a place to readily get advice, help and support, so they are missing that vital network. As a result, we are seeing much more challenging behaviour from parents and children, less engagement from them and a greater divide between school and home. Sure Start was a vital piece of this very complex jigsaw, and if the government truly believed in the levelling up agenda, ah, oh yes, uh, they should instantly reinstate this wonderful service. Um, we're talking about it because of calls upon the likely next government government, the one led by Keir Starmer, to indeed reintroduce, re-implement the Sure Start service. Um, huge. And remember, they were trying to sell us the big society at the time, as Mohammed reminds me. And uh, and someone else reminded me, the text has slipped down the line a little, so I can't see it. Oh no, it was Bernard in Newcastle, that a certain Dominic Cummings would have been on Michael Gove's shoulder at the time of, of, of these policy decisions. Good Lord. I, I, I thank God those unelected bureaucrats in Brussels got firmly removed from the body politic of the United Kingdom. Eh? 11.34 is the time. A couple of phone lines free on this. The difference that Shaw Start made to you, either as a parent, um, as a child, if because you're old enough now, but it'd be quite hard to know, or the difference that you as a parent know that it made to your child. 03456060. 973 is the number that you need. Toby's in Bristol. Toby, what would you like to say? Hello, um, James. Hello. I was a, I've been a primary school teacher since the early 1990s, so, okay. I've, lived through, so I've taught through uh, the inception of the national curriculum right the way through until COVID. Gosh, and gosh. I have to say that after 2010, the absolute kneecapping of Sure Start was one of the worst acts that I can imagine a government um, putting upon children uh, it, it's just an appalling abandonment of how, what it did for them well how did it hit you how, how did how did it how in did my in my i had a short start close to where i yeah. was um, teaching and the, the the fact that the teach sorry the parents had somewhere to go with support for their parenting for access to financial and also the, the children in terms of socialization and uh, a lot of what we saw in the classroom with a quite a few of the children i'm being a bit anecdotal of course it. yeah but it, it, it was the the slow degrading of their ability to interact and this is before covid so these these children who were getting input outside of school yeah. were then coming in with tools to be able to cope yeah, and course. what we see now is people who cannot cope because they they don't have that support anymore um and, and i think that the you know covid has obviously exacerbated this situation but it's the it's the fact that it was so deliberate it was the fact that it was so ideological did you see it immediately out. did you sense it at the time you, you, it was a bit of a it was a bit of an old oil tanker yeah moment. okay because, yeah. Uh, uh, because to start with um you know a bit like many things in politics there's that slow move where you have that overlap between what was go what was there before and the new reality and, and slowly it became clear that children were struggling more and more, and especially as access to special educational needs support was cut off as well, and it became incredibly hard to access it, along with the lack of teaching assistance support, which was going because schools were desperately trying to keep teachers what in the What did they expect to happen, Toby? What did they expect to happen? I don't know. I, I, I genuinely beg his belief when you, start, when you start try and think about the whole situation, yeah. it really is hard to understand where their mind went because it was so anti-people. It was so Maybe it's, it's that sort of anti-society thing where they just didn't want to support mm. the very things that actually make society better. It's almost like they wanted to, to set up an antagonistic, angry society <laughs> and, and to dismantle something that was widely perceived as a Labour success just for, for, for out of callousness, out of viciousness. Yes. I, I and if it had I been there for the, for, for the post-Covid decline in toddler development, it would have been even more valuable than it was before they got rid of it. Yes. I, I, I really cannot forgive. And, and then you've got Osborne on this podcast, you know, just, just, just walked away from it. They've all walked away from with no responsibility for that for their destructive actions. And it really is galling. It's galling. Uh, very, very diplomatic primary school teacher language there, yeah, Toby, you. for which <laughs> for, for also very radio friendly. But yeah, I mean, I pick up on some of these themes in my in my latest book because I, I find the the hand washing element of it, the Pontius Pilate style hand washing element of it, utterly repellent. I really do. And you're right, you know, popping up with 
portfolio careers or coming back to be foreign secretary, well, the consequences of the things they deliberately and cynically did are dealt with by professionals like you still on a daily basis, a daily basis, 11.38 is the time. I wonder if, I, I, this isn't necessarily a snark, although it might be, I reserve the right for it to turn into a snark as the point develops, but people who sort of cheered it along, because you cheer along everything the Tories do, Okay, can, can you can you remember what why you were supposed to be in favour of it? Oh, we can't afford it. Do you, do you remember there were people around this time telling us to stop blaming the bankers for the banking crisis that brought about an international economic catastrophe? Oh, don't blame the bank. We've got to stop blaming the bankers. We've got to be shutting sure start centres. Forget about windfall taxes. They are almost to a man and woman the same people that went on to sell you Brexit, to sell you Boris Johnson to sell you Theresa May, to sell you all of austerity, not just the closer of Sure Starts, to sell you Liz Truss, and of course, latterly, to sell you Rishi Sunak. And you know what they've started doing now? They've started complaining about the state of the country and blaming it all on lefties. It's a thing of absolute beauty. There's a piece in The Telegraph yesterday that singled out our friend and colleague Lewis Goodall as a representative of some sort of new elite. Lewis's dad was a welder. And Nick Timothy, who was responsible for most of the debacles that Theresa May presided over as both Home Secretary and Prime Minister, tried to single out Lewis as an example of some sort of I, I, previously unidentified malaise at the heart of the British establishment, claiming that he was part of the British. But I, these people, their brains are so boiled that you could spread them on toast. It's 11.40. Siobhan is... Two calls. I wait all my life for one call from Morikambi, and then I get two um, in the space of 10 minutes. Siobhan is also in Morecambe. Siobhan, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello. So, yes, uh, I'm a retired head teacher working as a consultant now, but oh. I was a primary head teacher in um, Morecambe, um, Lancashire, for over 23 years. Okay. Um, and the children's centres, when they were opened, were a wonderful initiative. They they were a one-stop shop for vulnerable families and people who needed help. So, you know, if, if you can't get into a car because you don't have one, um, it was on a pram push. People could get in there easily and could get the help they needed. And we saw it make a marked difference because before they arrived... Yeah we would really struggle to make referrals to the appropriate agencies. And then during their inception and their development, we saw uh, kind of swift and easy referral mechanisms became, became the norm. So you could, you could access support for a young mum who was struggling. You could access support for a child who wasn't hitting developmental milestones. And then from once they closed we kind of saw that fade away really quickly. And so we tried plugging the gaps yeah. with by putting stuff in place ourselves and by trying to find various um, voluntary agencies. But then they all started to close due to lack of funding. And then our funding was reduced. And, and now you have the terrible situation where there is just nowhere to go. There is nobody to refer to. And, and as a school leader, you're left holding your hand, uh, holding your head in your hands, just watching the situation deteriorate. So they, they have started to create family hubs now. In uh, in, a so in 75 local authorities. Yeah, yeah, and they're good, you know. But well, they're question, better than nothing. But, <laughs> but I watched, I watched the destruction of children's centres, and at the time. It felt to me like the single biggest act of social vandalism I'd ever witnessed. Still does, does puts it today. It, it, it did the thing that politicians rarely do, provided many years down the line. It's such an odd thing to be opposed to or to be committed to removing or reducing. At one point, as it was biting deep, um, I, I had a visit arranged with Nadine Sahawi, who was then Minister for Children and Families. Oh, yes and kind of started to talk to him about the need at the moment. If we don't work preventatively and we don't fund preventatively, what happens is need just keeps escalating until it hits crisis point. And at crisis point, you have to intervene, but it's kind of four or five times more expensive than it would be at preventative level. So, and, to, so, and you have to intervene there because it, it's life-saving. 
But if you could intervene at both ends, which we have to do at the moment, you would cut the need for crisis level intervention. And you would significantly reduce public spending. But uh, it kind of fell on deaf ears, I'm afraid. Well, uh, yeah, it did. Nadim Zahawi, of course, who, who it's probably a timely moment to remind ourselves of um, his well-documented issues with um, with tax arrangements, given some of the continuing effort to um, malign Angela Rayner. Siobhan, thank you. I, I, what a consensus. What what a remarkable consensus that this, this entire topic has proved to provide. Let me read you a couple as well. Uh, Phil picks up the political angle. He says, as a former Liberal Democrat parliamentary candidate, my party's inability to protect Shaw Start during the coalition years was a source of shame, which in part resulted in my leaving the party. I hope that my party, which I rejoined during the Brexit campaign, can recommit itself to the principles of Shaw Start. My wife and I were both teachers, so we knew full well the value of one of the best things that Labour ever did. Uh, I, w- I wonder if Ed Balls who, uh, asks George Osborne about this with the, cust- with the, with the requisite um, anger when they record their podcast together. Natalie and Walthamstow writes, we had a great Shaw Start Centre here. I cannot tell you how much they helped us. We're from a minority ethnic background and the centre not only gave us access to health advice and play groups, but additional activities such as music classes and chances to get peer support from other children and patients. If I had to highlight what parents, sorry, if I had to highlight one thing Shaw Start did for me, It was that they identified autistic traits in my son, which meant that after being seen by a health visitor at 21 months, he was diagnosed age three with autism. Um, It was previously a vague concern that I highlighted watching his interactions and straight away the health visitor could see an issue and organized a visit from an educational psychologist at my home about three months later. He is now predicted to get four A's and three B's in his GCSEs, but I have no doubt that this is the reason why, um, this early diagnosis is the reason why he was supported so effectively from the very start of school. It's, and do you know, that's, um, it's an extraordinary insight, isn't it? Into, into the, the, the sheer extent of the influence that they exercised. And, and going back to Nadim Zahawi, I was interested because it was, a, it was a, a, a tax lawyer called Dan Needle, that Zahawi tried to sue. He instructed libel lawyers to seek a withdrawal of allegations by the tax lawyer, Dan Needle, that one of his denials of tax avoidance was based on a lie. Uh, Other journalists were threatened with libel writs when they exposed information about him. He's undergone a sort of rehabilitation. I think he had quite a good post office scandal, but uh, he claims that he was smeared. And then, lo and behold, in January 2023, he agreed to pay a penalty to HMRC in relation to his tax affairs. And I, I was trying yesterday to, I'd like to know what Dan Needle had to say about Angela Rayner's tax situation. And as if by magic, he popped up on the News Agents podcast yesterday to, to share his thoughts and insights, which I thought I'd share with you after this. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 10 to 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Memo to self, don't swear in your in your break exchanges with the team in, a, in an affectionate and jokey manner because he, he, if, if the mic comes on, it didn't come on, did it? Just, in, if it just we were very close. Keith probably just pulled me back from the brink there. Once again, um, 10 to 12 is the time. I'll play you that Dan Needle on Angela Rayner's. It's about 1,500 quid's worth of capital gains tax that she may or may not have been liable for. Um, uh, 10, 15 years ago, I think before she was even an MP, but goodness me, you'd think that she'd done 10 William Rags, judging by the way that some right-wing journalists are still desperately trying to inflate the story. Does it remind anybody of a certain curry in Durham not long ago? But Nadim Zahawi's tax affairs were altogether more interesting. And, of course, his um, economy with the actuality about them saw him threaten journalists with libel actions to uh, take out... Uh, hire lawyers to go after a tax specialist called Dan Needle. They're absolutely adamant that he'd done absolutely nothing wrong. And then lo and behold, he uh, suddenly announced that he was paying an enormous fine to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, as it was then, because he had indeed done something wrong. It almost made the time that he charged you for the heating of his stables in Stratford-upon-Avon look like a, a minor transgression. But... Um, great minds think alike. So after I instructed Eleanor to try to get Dan Needle to talk to us about Angela Rayner's tax affairs, because he was very good on Twitter, it emerged that my colleagues over at the News Agents podcast had already done precisely that. And he very graciously recorded them a podcast, a podcast, a voice note 
um, because he was overseas at the time. And I thought it was probably worth listening to in its entirety. I started looking at Angela Rayner's position back in late February. There was a statement from her which said that, as with the majority of ordinary people who sell their own homes, I wasn't liable for capital gains tax because it was my home and the only one that I owned. That struck me immediately as wrong because at the time she sold her house, Angela Rayner was married. Now, if you're single and you own a house and it's your home, then it's your main residence. You're exempt from capital gains tax when you sell it. But if you're married, then the two spouses together only have one main residence. So if Angela Rayner thought that she wasn't liable for capital gains tax because one house was her home when her husband had another house, then that's wrong. That's not the way the rules work. It's very common for people to get tax wrong. It's not a criminal offence to get tax wrong. It's a criminal offence to get your tax wrong deliberately, intentionally, dishonestly. Is it possible that Angela Rayner, first of all, owed capital gains tax? We don't know if she did, but is it possible she owed it and didn't pay it deliberately, dishonestly? Sure, in a philosophical sense, it's possible. Do we have any reason to think she acted dishonestly? No. Would HMRC have a prosecutor case like this where there's no evidence of dishonesty? No, no, of course they wouldn't. The questions of tax evasion are silly, just as in a very different case. People who thought that Nadim Sahawi had criminally evaded tax. The time I identified that perhaps there was some tax he hadn't paid, uh, they were also off the mark. Because again, for something to be criminal, you have to prove intention not to pay tax. You have to prove dishonesty. And that is pretty unlikely for most people most of the time. And the evidence that you need to prosecute it is significant. You look at the raw period that she owned the house from 2007 to 2015. You said that some of it, it was her main residence up to 2009 or 2010. And some of it, it wasn't. You then get an additional two years exempt from capital gains tax at the end of that time. So 2013 to 2015. And so she ends up with really only a small amount of gain, depending on when exactly she moved in with her husband. It's somewhere between, I estimate, one and a half thousand pounds and three and a half thousand of capital gains tax. But a lot of people do improvements on their house. And if they're improvements that add value to it, then you get to deduct that from your capital gain. So broadly speaking, if Angela has spent £23,000 on improvements to the house, then probably you have no capital gain at all. All of which would say that we're speculating. We can say with some confidence, I think, that a capital gains liability is between zero and three and a half thousand pounds. We can't say any more without more details. What I said when I wrote my piece is that it's not very satisfactory for a leading politician to make a statement about their tax, which isn't correct, and then not clarify it. Ms. Rayner has said that she owes no capital gains tax, and she says she's received advice to that effect, but he hasn't said why. And maybe that's why this has continued to drag on and on, despite there not being very much money at stake. Just uh, always helpful, I think, to get some expert input on these matters, because you could be forgiven for thinking, if you read the Daily Mail, that she was responsible for regicide. Uh, 11.50, or, or, or of course not, as the case may be, 11.55 is the time. Back to Sure Start, and uh, one very powerful tweet about Govian ideology being responsible for damage visited upon this country uh, 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 of a generational nature, not just Govian, of course, but Dominic Cummings was sitting on Go's shoulder throughout much of this period. Richard is in Ash Ashby de la Zouch to steer us back to the story. Richard, what would you like to say? Hello, James. How are you? Very well, mate. What's on your mind? Good. Uh, yeah, I was, um, I was one of the original Sure Start programme managers um, back in the late 90s. And... Oh, yes. um, it's just so good to hear this re re report today confirming what we all knew at the time. And, and, and we knew then that what we were doing was for the long term. Um, and, it, and it's just so heartening to, to hear it. Well, one of the things that we did, which people might not realise, is um, we, we got all the services in a local area to work together better. That's just so that was, the, that was a, the aim of what yeah, we were doing. I mean, it's such an obvious thing, isn't it? And yet 
so yeah. so new when it finally happened. It was, well, if just if, when um, when he came into office, Tony Blair said, "I want my ministers to spend more time in each other's offices," and that was the oh, sort of what we were meant to be doing. Yeah. So you know, we were working with health, education, social services, police, um, local shops, local parents groups groups of people that weren't even groups that just knew each other and we'd help them to to form into like a local parent set up and things um we'd, we'd get them to run a play group in their local so church what, what, what sort of differences in, in terms of an actual child or an actual parent what sort of differences would you encounter oh tons i mean parents you just saw them growing in confidence wow. um we used to do things like get them to um i was, I was up in um Haringey. So, so a bunch of them would go out with their buggies around the, the shops of Wood Green and come back and report on which ones were child-friendly and we'd circulate that in, you know, which ones you could get a buggy through if you're looking for clothes and, and just stuff like that, just um, working together and getting more confident. Um, and that led to things like them not taking the kids to the hospital whenever they had a temperature. Oh, wow. They'd, they'd sort of, they'd ring each other and they'd yeah. tell them, oh, no, just, you know, a bit, a bit of cowpaw, they'll be all right. Check them again for a couple of hours. So we had data on sort of lower, you know, lower admissions to A and E, less presentations at the GP, all those sort of things. But it's taken this long to get the information about educational achievement, which we all thought was was what we were it's doing it for in the long run. run. Yeah, and, and, and we're so we're back. Your years on oddly, we're back to the first call of today, which was about the NHS, not about Sure Start, and about the role that the media plays in keeping this information from the people. The, the, the way that if you knew how much the average GP got for the average patient, you'd be in absolute uproar about claims that it's their fault people aren't being seen or it's their fault the profession is crumbling. And the same with sure starts. If everyone could have seen what you've seen, if it was being put on the front pages of newspapers, if it was being shouted from the rooftops, they never would have let Michael go tear it to shreds, would they? No, as soon as they came in in 2010, it was... Uh it was it was on the yeah it was on the it, it, it was it was it was on the chopping board i don't know that i've ever had uh, a topic not for a long time where qualifications were so key richard the second or third sure start manager that we've spoken today we've had two or three uh retired head teachers as a retired accountant um getting in touch about the angela rayner non-story and and i mean incredible contributions from people who everybody remotely involved with sure start thought it was one of the best things i would go so far as to say one of the best things that had ever happened to this country um, which makes a nice contrast with Suella Braverman, of course, who's back in the news bulletins today, because she is, I think, inarguably one of the worst things that's ever happened to our country. And just you wait till you hear the latest news on that Rwandan adventure of hers. James O'Brien on LBC. I remember this. I, I, do you remember when she went to Rwanda and she got photographed cackling? In, in, in the mo I mean, listen, I'm a very unphotogenic individual. I know what you're thinking. No, you're not, James. I've seen you on the side of a bus. You look lovely. That was about 205 years ago that photograph was taken. Um, and it, it is, frankly, high time we got them replaced. So I'm not really in a position to criticise others for being unphotogenic. But if you're in a place to which desperate refugees are likely to be deported and you're laughing in a manner reminiscent to me, at least, of the Wicked Witch of the West in that much-loved family film, The Wizard of Oz, uh, I, I think you're open to a little bit of, of, of light ribbing. So she went to Rwanda to be photographed near some houses, which she claimed were um, uh, the places in which these putative asylum seekers would be, uh, would be housed in the event of anybody actually ever being deported to Rwanda, despite quite feasibly being a, a genuine asylum seeker, a genuine refugee who, for example, might have helped the British forces in incredibly dangerous circumstances, but that wouldn't get you an exemption under this government's current plans from any form of deportation. And it, it was pointed out at the time, including by me, but I, I, I will confess to you that I was relying upon a little bit of digging done by the rather splendid Times columnist Hugo Rifkind, and he did a little bit of digging into it and discovered that the estate that she was visiting was being built anyway. It was a housing project in Kigali that was both underway and established long before anybody ever mentioned the possibility of deporting asylum seekers from the United Kingdom to Africa. Um, it, it, the, the idea that they um, were building them to order, as Hugo Rifkin pointed out, was highly, highly unlikely. 
uh, even got the name of it, you know, the, the, the Buiza Riverside Estate, and pointed out that all of the photos seemed to be designed to create the idea that it were being built specifically to house our asylum seekers. Um, uh, th- th- there was no guarantee even that they'd get to live there anyway until after they had opted to stay and become resident. So as Hugo pointed out in March of 2023, almost a year ago to the day, he pointed out the whole thing, this whole trip, which would have been taxpayer funding, is her standing in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in Rwanda going, this is what a house looks like. He then, to his credit, was contacted by the Home Office who told him that he'd got it all wrong and he refused to take his claims down because he was fairly confident that he'd got it all right. And he even dug out the first report of the housing development, which predated um, all of the British deportation uh, saga by, by some time. So guess what happened today? Guess what happened today? Guess what emerged today about the houses that Suella Braverman Uh, sought to portray as being built specifically to house deported asylum seekers from the UK. Um, Well, I'll tell you what happened today, if you don't know already. It turned out that 70% of these properties on this development that she was photographed cackling in front of have already been sold to to locals. Um, Make of that what you will. So remember that, that when she was at the Home Secretary, somebody got somebody to ring a journalist to say, no, you're wrong. This is, you're wrong when you say this isn't being built for us. And now 70% of it has been sold to other people because it was all along being built for entirely different purposes to the ones presented to the British people by a former lawyer whose greatest achievement when she was a barrister was to contribute to a legal textbook. Well, so, well, an achievement she considered so great that she put it on her actual professional biography on the Chambers website, uh, her Chambers website, until the big issue rang up and said, we've been speaking to the bloke who actually wrote the textbook, and he says you did nothing at all except perhaps one bit of photocopying, at which point she rang her Chambers and asked them to take down the claim from their website website because it because it was still up there at the time um so there you go that's suella braverman star of today's news bulletins seven minutes after 12 is the time you are listening to james o'brien on lbc now i want you to be honest with me was that bad mannered of me with regard to 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 suella braverman was that bad mannered of me and Are you of the view that that bad manners are on the increase? How do you guard against, particularly if you're 52 years old and given to a very generous disposition, how do you guard against in my, what what I have elected to call, and I don't, I've not come across this phrase before, but it's unlikely that I've invented it myself. How do you guard against in my day-itis? How can you be confident that you're not suffering from a very bad case of in my day-itis? So you find something or you encounter something that you find unpleasant and you reflect upon the fact that we did things rather better in my day. That is where in my day-itis comes from. And I don't think I am suffering from in my day-itis when I turn my attention to two issues. All right. One of which we're going to talk about and one of which we're not. The first issue is spelling. We have now lost the battle, I think, to argue that spelling matters. I remember the first time we did it on the show and I would get calls from university lecturers telling me that it no longer mattered one jot if their students couldn't spell to save their lives as long as they knew what the intended word was. And I am 100%... Uh, aware of the difficulties of dyslexia and I wouldn't for a minute suggest that there shouldn't be special dispensations for people with with any form of of special educational need or learning difficulty or whatever it may be but I don't know I, I, I felt that the abandonment of the position that spelling words actually mattered was a was a minor was a tiny tiny tragedy a tiny tragedy. Well, actually, I probably started off thinking it was quite a big tragedy, but a tiny, tiny tragedy. And I still struggle really to resile from that position, e- even though the the consequences of it are now, I think, unstoppable. Spelling no longer matters. And yet, when I get the very occasional request for, for, for help or work experience or whatever it might be, if there are, and I don't know that computers should correct most misspellings anyway which makes my position even more archaeological 
I still I still care, and I presume other people do as well. Maybe younger people care a bit less if you're in a position to, to give a job application that has spelling mistakes on it. Would if I was ever in charge of job applications, it would, I promise, go straight in the bin. I'm probably breaking employment law there, am I, in some way, shape or form? I'm not sure, but I'm just funny like that. So that is that is in my deitis. I, I have got a fat case, a big case. If, if, if in my deitis had physical symptoms, I'd have broken out in hives at the state of spelling in this country today and i i'm getting a very similar feeling now regarding what can only be loosely described as as manners i i, I mean specifically in the context of some research that's been published or, or conducted for the pizza restaurant chain prezzo um but actually more broadly as well the the, the, the explosion of bad manners in the last few years has has, has really taken me back or taken me aback because of course there's a difference between being taken back and being taken aback if i were to be taken back i'd be able to decide whether or not i'm suffering from a case of in my deitis my mum was an absolute tyrant for table manners i, I full on take elbows off the table right knife and fork don't hold it like that i would never as a child have eaten as i would do now I would eat some dishes just with a fork. Continental, I'm very sophisticated like that, very sophisticated. So some meals I'd eat just with a fork. You would do that, right? I don't mean spaghetti bolognese. You can't eat spaghetti bolognese with a knife and fork, although I'll check with her after the show. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Mum wouldn't have insisted we tried to eat spaghetti bolognese with a knife and fork. I wasn't even allowed to scoop my peas onto a, an upturned fork. I had to spear them onto the end of the fork at Sunday lunch. So table manners in my house growing up were, were de rigueur. And I, I, that might be why I find this story today so jarring. 54% of all age groups believed that table manners were outdated. And if you confine this to Generation um, Z, the figure goes up to 60. 60% 60 of these people think it's perfectly acceptable to uh, put your elbows on the table, to eat with your mouth open, to use your phone, that's another one as well, chewing loudly. I, 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 I'm just staggered by it, but I want to broaden it out to something else as well. I did meet Buster Blood Vessel once, actually, as we, as we talk about bad manners. He was a lovely bloke. Uh, I broaden it out as well. The thing, and Sheila Fogarty has picked up on this as well, and it's, it's an extraordinary example of what bad manners are in their very essence. Bad manners are when you do something entirely optional that is almost certain to upset somebody else or to disturb somebody else. I, 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 to disturb their equilibrium, to disturb their day, to disturb their peace, to rob them of the zen-like calm with which they ordinarily conduct their affairs. And I bet you know what it is. In fact, I know you know what it is because I've, I've told you before. It, 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 it's the thing on public transport particularly on public transport if you're doing it in the street it's a lot less jarring because i'm only going to walk past you aren't i but public transport is the only place really where you're cheek by jail with total strangers for a significant amount of time and this this habit now that people have of having quite loud conversations or watching content on a screen without using earphones without using any any kind of headset just sitting there with the volume on, having a conversation on a bus. I don't think that's in my deitis. I think there has become a, um, I don't know. And apparently Julia says I would be breaking the, the Equality Act if I discriminated against a job applicant because of spelling mistakes. But we're not having that conversation today. We're not having that conversation, or, or pro probably ever, if Julia's right. <laughs> I don't want to open myself up to future problems. But... I, 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 I want you to tell me whether or not table manners matter. 0345 6060973 is the number that you need. I, I can't shake the notion that they do. It just seems to me that most of the time table manners are, um, are, are deployed in order to, to but for, for reasons of decorum, for reasons of tidiness. And, and we'll do a little bit. I don't want to go mad about this, but a little bit, a side order, if you, if you like, of your biggest bugbear 
that that but it's got to be something that that wasn't commonplace when you were younger but is commonplace now so something that you didn't used to see much but you do see all the time now or you see it a lot now and 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 you've got to be honest with me it's got to it's got to be a jet was it a hackle or a heckle it's a hackle isn't it it's got to it's got no it's a hackle it's got to raise your hackles it's got to get your is it a heckle or a hackle a hackle or a heckle or a heckle or a hackle or a hackle or a heckle or oh heck you've got it's got to be something that genuinely raises your heckles or hackles or both it can't just be you know oh i'm mildly annoyed by that because i i i catch myself I can't stop myself from uh, uh, saying something to people who, or, or like saying, have you heard of headphones or just something a little bit silly like that? I, I'm obviously doing what I do for a living now. I can't really get stuck in, in public scenarios in the way that I may once have done. I do. And, and then I worry that I've got in my dayitis because it's not that long ago. In fact, even in the years that I've had this job, people would complain about people having the volume too high on their headphones, right? You remember that? Do you remember when we all complained about that? And I think I took a call bloke once from a bloke who claimed that he carried scissors on his commute so that he could snip the wires of, of people who had the volume too high on their headphones and therefore disturbed their fellow passengers. But I do think, I don't know. I, so I, when I ask you, does it matter? I'm asking it in the same way that I asked about spelling. That's why I brought spelling into it, because I can't shake the conviction that it matters. I am... I am a man made by my experiences. I am a product of my past. And and when it comes to spelling and when it comes to table manners, I I I I can't shake my formative years, my formative experiences. However powerful your argument is, however many breaches of employment law I may be undertaking by implementing some of my opinions, that is who I am. And I would need an awful lot of help to stop being that person if I was in a job where it mattered. Thankfully, I'm not. So is table manners the same? Or rather, are table manners the same? Is it like spelling? Is it just something that old people care about? Or is there a reason why we should all care more? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Just taking a broad consensus on my editorial staff, by which I mean people who text or WhatsApp the show. We are indeed looking for hackles. We are looking for hackles, not heckles. It raises your hackles. So... Why does it matter? 0345 is the number that you need. Why do manners matter to you? Why should they matter to all of us? 0345 Three questions here, as usual, on this program. I always like to go for the hat trick. So that's question number one. Question number two is the easiest, but we will guard against dullness, if you like. Um, always guard against dull. Never be dull. It, the thing that didn't happen when you were younger, but happens everywhere now, that drives you absolutely tonto, all right? 03456060973. And then we can allow ourselves a moment of meldruism, I think. And it may be a slight outbreak of my deitis. Why? Why? Because if your parents had good table manners... Logic suggests that you should do as well. So, so it shouldn't. It shouldn't be something. Or, or manners. Public sp- transport manners are a big thing for me because I spend a lot of time on public transport. Why? If things are not being passed on from parent to child, I mean, short start centres just popped into my head given some of the contributions that we enjoyed in the last hour. But why would this? Yeah, I crack a few of you reminding me of that old phrase: "Manners maketh man." And it, it was a way of keeping chaos at bay, wasn't it? It was a mark of civilization. The more well-mannered a society, the, the, more, the more harmonious it was, the more peaceable it was, perhaps. Uh, but I would have said all of the same things about spelling. So maybe I'm as wrong about manners as I was about spelling, and I will be as unable to admit it in the one context as I remain in the other. Should we get the phone lines up and running, see how we get on with this? All right, then, if you insist. 0345 973 And please, everybody watch your P's and your Q's as carefully as possible. James O'Brien on LBC. So I, I've been sent a copy of De Bretz from 1981. De Bretz is a, a weird old business. It's a sort of etiquette guide, and it's, it's, it's latterly evolved into an etiquette coaching company. And as far as I can tell, and, and thank you for this, Tickling Sticks, who, who says our dads were both Yorkshiremen, I still have a copy of his Debrett's copy of Modern Manners from 1981. Uh, from the diagram, it's acceptable to you turn your fork upside down and, and 
shovel your or, 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 or coax your peas onto it with your knife if you're putting them on on at the teens end of it or are they speared i can't tell whether they're speared oh they must be speared mustn't they yeah you spit, spit well no but you can do it with an upside down fork so, you know, not that long ago, people wrote books about the acceptable way of eating peas. I don't know that that's necessarily something that we should crave a return to. But at the same time, the abandonment of table manners to the point where 54% of the population believe them to be outdated seems to me to be a, a sadness, a sadness. 12.21 is the time. Adam is in Luton. Adam, what made you pick up the phone? Hi there. Yeah, Hello. I just wanted to call because you are... Uh you whet my appetite with this because this is like my real um, bugbear. Is it? Like, I really can't stand... And again, like you said with you and Sheila um, about the headphones, but I think those are yesterday's problems. Go on. I don't know if you've seen the decline in uh, the social acceptance, but someone needs to write a book on what new manners are because for me... Who I used to write um, a column for the Daily Express called Modern Manners. You've just reminded well, me. Well, bring it back. Bring it I hadn't, back. Well, I can't write for the Express these days. It's gone completely down the rabbit hole. But back... I, I, my I, goodness me, Modern Manners. Gosh, I haven't thought about I've that taken, in 30 years, 25 years. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> well, I've taken to actually social media shaming people. Yeah. I don't put their faces. Well, I, you, don't, I you don't put, you don't put their faces. People taking their shoes off or clipping their nails... On public transport. Not toenails. And last week... Not uh, toenails. No, no, no. Okay, not the toenails. Fingernails. Admittedly. I see, I but their fingernails, got... I think it's disgusting. To, and then they spit out their little nasty clippings. Like, bring back shame, man. Have some shame. Well, I, I, do then, you know what? I mean, you can't see me because you're not watching on... Uh, you, YouTube hasn't gone out yet, but I have nail clippers in my pocket at the moment. Well, you are the worst person in the world. Uh, no, but I wouldn't do it. In front of anyone, I just okay, good, I, I good, just good. I can't remember why I picked them up on the way out of the house this morning, but I noticed that my fingernails needed a bit of a trim, and I thought, well, I'll do it later in the loo or something like that. And then the next thing that I hate, and I actually confronted somebody about it last week because I just think we, we need confronted to start... somebody. Nah, mate, mate, you don't know. Someone spat yeah. indoors yeah. on public transport. No, that's right. Yeah, you are you an am- like, so? What did you do you? then? Just cut, cut, tell me I what you did. Them, are you from somewhere where that's acceptable? I, like, that is not normal in anywhere in the world that I know, indoors, on carpet. Do you and know what I mean? happened? Well, well, what happened? Did it kick off? Well, he just gave me the dirty look, and I did think to myself, like, why? I need to just work out a way to cope, Spitting because I don't want to get myself stabbed or get into a fight. But no. I think that is just the most inhuman... Like, it does. You do, you, know you I mean? do sound quite excitable, Adam, if you don't mind me May. saying so. Slim on a public. What, like, no, I, hey, I'm disgusting. not defending it. I'm not defending it. I'm just sort of thinking a little. I mean, you know, for your own sort of safety, no, no, no. And blood well, pressure. My new thing is, that we need to learn how to drive, or we need to start. Public, so it's the public transport. For you. What about the dinner table? What about the dinner table? How are you with that? Because you, you've uh, got public transport problems here, mostly, haven't you? Well, I suppose on the dinner table, it's like maybe people eat with their mouth open, or people that like cough and then cover their mouth, or people that like. You know, lick their fingers. I think that's disgusting too. But I think there needs to be an all-round shame. Because it depends what you're eating. I grew up around some some foods are yeah. finger licking good. <laughs> yeah, and just finally, I just wanted to say, like, I think you're so cool, and I love that you have more followers than LBC itself, and you have more followers than the the lead of this cup, this lead of LBC. So you're proven that hope. Well, that, well, that, well I, I, I might just mean I'm good followers. on Twitter. I, let's not read too much into it, Adam. You are but, bigger but, than the actual station you're on in terms of social media following, so it just shows that you can't be hateful and win. That's what I wanted to say. I've always wanted to tell you that. I'm not very big on threads at the moment, and I need, I need to up my Insta game. But what a nice thing to say, Adam. Thank you so much. It's 12, 24 minutes after 12. Adam, a young man. Just, I mean, what's it like with the children these days? So, I'm trying to think, we've just been quite lucky. Again, I think just sort of gentle influence. So, the children don't know anything that my mum would have a problem with, I don't think. Uh, and if, if, if she did, I think she'd probably tell me, if not them. But it is, it is a changing world. Uh, Simon's in Hull. Simon, what would you like to say? Well, let's all just take a deep breath after that one. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, you were absolutely spot on when what you said was manners maketh man. Right. Um, it's, not an, uh, it's not an increase in bad manners. It's an absence of good manners. And, What's um, the difference? It, uh, so, I mean, that sounds like a good phrase at first glance, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of second glances. What's the difference between an increase? No, it's an increase in bad manners. 
Well, uh, what, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a meaningless platitude, that. You can't get away with that on this programme. Oh, increase... oh, oh, all right, I, I, I retract. It's I an retract. increase in bad yes, manners. No. Not a decrease... Well, maybe it's exactly the same thing. But anyway, what, what, what's your beef, as it were? Let's, let's talk about knife licking. Licking? Yes. But that, um, oh, dear. I mean, we were taught that was just dangerous. Let alone anything uh, yeah. else. And, and, um, uh, I'm in a situation whereby um, a, a 14-year-old boy has come into my life, and I, I love him very much, and I love his mother very much. Right. Um, his table manners leave a lot to be desired. Oh. Um, he li- he licks his knife, um, and I, what I, without you know uh, giving him um, any sort of humiliation, yeah. I said, look, it's it's not an attractive habit. If you want, as you get older and grow up and start dating, um, good table manners will make an impression. Well, you, I, 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 I'm go- I mean, he's not seeking to date people like you or me, is he, of our generation? He's seeking to date people of his own generation, and 60% of them think that table manners are a, a thing of the past. But, uh, but, but everyone's yeah, probably so. got a limit. They probably are thinking about using the phone at the table or putting their elbows on the table. I, I'd have thought that... If you polled specifically on knife licking, you'd have a you'd have a majority of people opposed to it, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Well, so one would have thought, um, but uh, ev- evidently not. We're, we're working on it. We're working on it. And you do um, it nicely, and, I hope. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I've, I've what I've said to him is, is look, you know, the good manners, good table manners, yeah. good conversational skills, and a broad general knowledge makes one very attractive and very impressive to young ladies. Right. You sound a bit like Swiss Tony now. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) I'll leave you you to think on that. It's like a merry-go-round of of unwelcome advice at the moment, this. Sonia is in Tooting. Sonia, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, what an amazing speech to you. Of all the topics that I ring this you up, This is the one I that's tempted you it. out. <laughs> yeah. Um, people not saying thank you. <sighs> so, um, for example, not so long ago, I was walking with an elderly la- uh, neighbour yes. with a walking stick. She had a walking stick in her 80s. So we're walking along uh, a road nearby and um, someone's coming toward us with a buggy and uh, a dog attached to the buggy and we pull up, we stop, there's not enough room, we move over to one side, they, she just walks past, not even a thank you. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I, that does annoy me as well, but oddly, and I wonder whether this is a point of the conversation that we've missed so far, it happens so much now. I've become a bit more inured to it because I used to, I, I, I used to quite, and I've said this on the show before, I used to do quite a loud you're welcome in those circumstances, yeah. but I've yeah. stopped being that person. Maybe that was... No, I, I, I turned around actually and went, thank you! Yes. And, it was sort of very loud and what voice. happened then? Because that's quite um, rude, Sonia, in a way. Just- because they just might have just on. been, they might have just been bereaved. You've got no idea no. why. You've got no, no insight. Yes. No. Yes. No. Easily. No. Or worse. No. Yes. Well, the they might have lost a lottery is... ticket. No. They might have lost no. a pound and found a penny. No. Well, how do you explain the other thing? I mean, even you get runners. I uh, so again, a few months ago, we were visiting family, going for a lovely walk by the river. Yes. Just walking. No, uh, runners are rude. Breath. Runners are just rude, though. And again, just. You know, we didn't hear him. We didn't see him. He came up behind us. We COVID, kind of, COVID, was COVID was mad for that. COVID was mad for that. Do you remember he COVID? Though, yeah. when every the runners just, felt just, that everyone else was somehow impinging upon their turf during during COVID actually lockdown. Actually, to to physically touch me with his arm and literally swing me as he ran by. Yeah, that's physical. And then again, that's not even a not even a sorry and carry on. Just carried on like it was. Did nothing. he have headphones in? Um, he did, but he saw us. It wasn't no, I know, but I think it. sometimes when they're... I mean, you feel that I'm quibbling with I'm just not... I don't think not saying thank you is on the same page as some of the other stuff. It's, it's just... It's a, it's, it's a, it's a you problem. I, it's a good problem, and I share it, Sonia. I have the same problem, but it's a you problem. It's, an, it's a problem of expectation, whereas the person listening to the music without having their headphones in or watching TV or conducting a phone call on speaker 
in a crowded train carriage, that's a them problem. That's, 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 no one can be realistically expected not to care about that because it distracts you from everything. But, a fa- but you're right, and, and millions of people will agree with you. I did feel my uh, hackles rising during the permitted walks during lockdown. Do you remember that? When you could go out for a permitted walk in very limited and specific circumstances. And it was the runners that were just so... Not all of them. I'm not, I'm not a generaliser in general. But the runners were shocking. And the more lycra they were wearing and the, and, the, and the more likely they were to have earphones in, the more shocking they were. But I do get that. I do get that because you're in a zone, aren't you, when you're doing that? But holding a door open, you hold a door open for somebody and, and you are clearly stepping out of the... You're clearly slowing your own journey down in order to facilitate theirs. Then I move into Sonia mode, and, and, I, and I, I'm always tempted to give it a I still do occasionally, just a quick, oh, you're very welcome. Oh, you're welcome. And they usually go, oh, sorry, thank you, which is why I sometimes think they might just be a little bit distracted. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 34 is the time. Flipping heck, writes Carl, although those aren't actually the words he used. This is a real middle-class conversation. I don't, I don't know that it is, actually. I, I, I think that manners, table manners in particular, were I, I, like a code that you would teach your children in order to make sure that no one in the middle class could look down on them. But I take your point, Carl. I and many others didn't have three meals a day and still can't afford to, but God forbid you eat quickly and have your elbows on the table. Manners are a product of upbringing, but 30 years of two parents working to buy essentials have left many children to raise themselves. It's pearl-clutching madness on the show today. I I, I mean, in in many ways, I did invite you to comment on why you think this might have happened. And the idea that you're not... You can still sit down for your family meal at the end of the day if both parents are working, although you're much less likely to. You're going to watch it in front of the telly or the kids are going to watch it in their... going to eat in their room on their their machines. And yet, and yet, and yet, I can't shake the notion that it matters, even though perhaps the... uh, the fear of my dayitis is growing with every call. Shauna is in County Down in Northern Ireland. Shauna, what would you like to say? How are you doing, James? Um, it's quite relevant to what you just said. They're actually uh, in how we teach table manners so that people don't look down yeah. on us. Um, so my 10-year-old daughter recently at school was holding her fork uh, kind of like a spoon, you know, shovel side yeah. up, um, and was chastised, uh, chastised by her uh, peers that this was the wrong way to really? hold her fork. And a 10-year-old I was it. Ten-year-old girl, and that made me think about it actually very recently. As to okay, well, I haven't taught her that you know it's polite to hold your fork the other way. I don't hold my fork the other way. I wasn't made to, um, and then it made me think: Have I failed? What was her? she? What you was know? she eating? Oh, she was eating uh, school dinners. So yeah, but what nothing, was it? Uh, what was it? Oh, I don't know. I mean, well, it matters. It flipping things. matters, Shauna. It matters. <laughs> Chicken nuggets and chips. Something. Oh, it was okay. nothing. Uh, and you that's know, how something. she'd eat at home. I mean, it's quite odd behaviour of her friends, actually, I would say. More, more <laughs> in... Go on. And how you were brought up, you know, you were taught that that was a shameful thing to do, to have your elbows on the table or to hold your fork wrong. Yes. Um, and... And yet you would pass that on, you know. Um, and so uh, clearly that's the household that those children have come from. You know, you can't do that. That's wrong. Well, they're, you know? they're, no, um, they're, they're very ill-mannered. Because the other thing you'd be taught is never to make anybody else feel uncomfortable. So even as fair, you even as fair, you deployed yeah. all the right knives and forks and, 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 and kept your elbows scrupulously clear of the table area and all of the other things, you would never, ever use it as, as, a, as a snobbish point-scoring exercise in order to make other people feel less comfortable. That was another crucial. Mm. Part and, and probably if you have that alongside the manners issue, then then it ceases to be quite as toxic as it might otherwise appear. If you're trying to make somebody else feel uncomfortable, then you're you're the one with the problem. That becomes a you problem rather than a them problem. And so your your, your little girl, I think, was more sinned against than sinning in that in that context. Uh, Geraldine says it's very condescending to call this a middle class problem. Richard takes up the point. This is not a middle class problem. I'm very much working class and was raised working class. My nan and granddad really instilled manners into us and it does drive me mad. However, now I'm a little bit more open about other people being distracted, etc. But I just needed to say that it's definitely not a middle class problem. Um, Steve suggests, and I think his tongue is in his cheek, which is an improvement on what's normally there, because he writes, I bite my toenails on the tube simply to secure empty seats on either side of me. Matthew's in Toaster. Matthew, what made you pick up the phone? Uh, I'm hearing about all these um, uh, social uh, problems. Yes. We just came back from Singapore. And, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> 
Singapore, we remember the chewing gum incident. And uh, but did someone get? A, did you, you you don't get flogged for chewing gum. You get flogged for chewing but gum with an yes. actual flog <laughs> so flogger. Not, not for the chewing gum. No, no for for no, graffiti. For, for spitting your gum out on the floor. You spit your gum out on the floor, and you can be publicly flogged. Uh, I don't know if they publicly do it, but, but they but do. It was they about flog- flogging. It was a, it was a story it. about an American. I remember that, that, it. I remember it well. Yeah. Um, but also, there's no eating or drinking on their tubes. Uh, there's no jaywalking. Uh, and, um, of course, there were signs everywhere that you couldn't bring your Dorian fruit anywhere. Yeah. But, uh, but their, their, their um, streets are impeccably clean. Uh, oh, they would be. There's no litter on the floor. Um, uh, Did you like it? This. Did you like it personally? I absolutely loved Singapore. I thought it was. I thought I didn't didn't, didn't know what to expect, but I, I couldn't believe how clean it was. And uh, how and how does it manage? I mean, do you see? Is it is it just normal police officers enforcing this, or do you have specific operatives going after the kind of that low level antisocial? Uh, I, I didn't see any uh, many police. Um, giving any fines out. Oh. Um, but I saw people gave us gentle sort of, um, told us about in, in, in the tube how to put, there were always somebody standing by telling you how to use the um, uh, the, the turnstiles. and uh, Member of staff. But, yeah, there, so, there were people about to, to help you out. And uh, and people just didn't drop things. I mean, there, there was plenty of places to put your litter. Um we also, we ended up in Tokyo as well at the end. Of, we were very lucky to have it such a nice holiday. But yes. ag- again, just such a clean society. And, you know, almost going like three weeks without seeing people spitting or, or sort of stuffing food in their face. And uh, I wouldn't imagine that anybody playing uh, a mobile phone or pictures loud uh, just didn't see it. Maybe I was so excited about being there. I didn't notice it. No. But people are so courteous. I, I, I don't. I mean, that's the problem. I wonder whether society can do it without external pressure, you know, without it actually there being rules and punishments in place, whether so sort of probably a bit more my day itis but thinking when you just did it because it was respectful of of others rather than fearful of punishment are two slightly different things i think i i, I wish you were right but i, I don't think that that uh, it's a i think we, we've gone so far yeah uh down down the wrong way that it would be so hard to train everybody or to even teach the basic things i drive a lot for a living and and one of the things that that probably makes me lose an hour of life. I get so stressed by it. It's seeing people in the cars around me just just opening their windows and, and dropping whole Stuff bags and throwing so coffee so cups so on the vulgar, floor. It's so vulgar, isn't it? It's so vulgar. It's so, it's, it, I, mean, it, 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 I don't it's think horrid. that that's not my day-itis, is it? We're trying to draw the line then between what we are right to complain about because really, if you've got your elbows on the table when you're eating, that's that's... Do you know what the origin... Thank you, Matthew. Do you know what the origin of that is? Well, I think the... Do you know what the origin of that? Well, I'll say what I think the origin of that is, and then you tell me whether you think I'm right or not. It's it's maritime, right? It's naval. You're not nodding. You're probably wrong. So the, 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 the elbows on the table thing is probably linked to the way that food was served on ships, which would be on trestle tables, because you wouldn't have a permanent dining area on a ship because you needed it for other stuff like um, cargo and crew so they'd pull out the tables which would be trestle tables so you'd have a flat tabletop which would be stowed against a wall uh, a wall what's the wall of a ship called anyway st- stowed against the ship's wall and then you'd have a couple of trestles which also don't take up much space but when you put them together you get a massive table around which everyone could could sit or squat or, or probably have little stools and of course on a trestle table you put your elbows on the table on a trestle table the whole thing's going to go belly up the whole thing's going to flip over so it would become a a very self preservation it would become a, an act of good sense not to put your elbows on the table and then that because the victorians were obsessed with such things that probably during the victorian era translated into nobody should ever put their elbows on the table to which the children i always got on with best at school would respond with why why not? Because it's bad manners. Yeah, but why? Because it's bad manners. But And then you get to that moment that some of us sort of reached more than others when we were children, when someone in authority turns around and says, because I say so. And that's when you know that they don't really have an argument. And that's what I've managed to turn into an entire career. Uh, James is in Sheffield. James, what would you like to say? 
<laughs> Hello, James. Uh, I just love it. Uh, hey, I'd just love to say it. I love the explanation of where the elbows on the table. Uh, it might be made up. It's, if this was QI, Sandy Toxic could press a button, and I'd look like um, Alan. What's his chops now? And I'd have got yeah. it all wrong. But who, we, who? I hope not. I hope not. No, I mean it makes sense. It, it makes does. Sense. I'm, I'm just trying to think of what the percentage of people on the planet are, are actual sailors. Uh, yes. And how much it really matters because. Uh, so to go back to when I was speaking to your researcher, what, what I'd say on this is, when it comes to social manners, so when you're speaking to people, uh, you know, respect's key. Uh, I've, I've got three children. I brought them up with respect. I'm a similar age to you. Uh, they matter to me uh, purely because I don't want to hurt anyone else's feelings or, or you know, I want to be respectful. Yes. And I want them to be as well. Where I have come undone a little bit and got a little bit softer as I'm older, um, is, is, the, is the elbows on the table the, the things like that I mean that to me just really don't matter in any way well it's the why I just, well, it's a perfect call to follow that little adventure a moment before you came on because when you say why if you can't answer it I mean, why? okay so you answer me this why does it matter if someone else wants to cut their toenails on the tube because someone's going to have to clean it up yeah exactly but if exactly. you put, why does it matter if you put your elbows on the table I mean, I, I went to a, a primary school. I'll never forget it. One of my best friends, he was left-handed. So he'd always pick his knife and fork yeah. up in the opposite hand to everyone else. And they, uh, the, the teachers were furious. They would not let him do it. Oh. You must have him in the other hand. It'd be beaten out of you, wouldn't it? Struggle. Again, in Victorian yeah. times, it would be, you'd, be, you'd have your hands strapped. So you'd be, it was seen as a sign of... I think that's where the word sinister comes from. It'd be seen as a sign of sort of d- 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 demonic possession or something like that. So, so if you cannot explain in a sentence why someone shouldn't be doing it, we shouldn't be worrying about it. Absolutely, I'd go along with that. Oh, but I, I mean, just to go back to... Actually, a couple of points you've made. So, so looking at the class system of it, yeah. uh, if you like, uh, and also, actually, this goes back to the show star stuff. While ever there is an aspiration tried to, to, to be taught to uh, socially, uh, you know, uh, a civilization, it's almost like the ones that haven't got it should be aspiring to do what the other ones do. And it allows the people in the upper classes to feel better than the ones below. It almost yeah. feels a little bit controlling. Well, that's why I talked about the, you know, the, the the nastiness of making people feel bad about it, like a, a, a lady in Northern Ireland's daughter being made to feel bad, because that's really bad manners. But the, the deliberate attempt to ring fence privilege is it uses all sorts of codes, not just manners. But one of my all time favourites is the is the pronunciation of certain words. The only one I can ever remember is is Beecham, where it's spelt Beauchamp. But pronounced Beecham, and you do it. It was it was one of the was it one of the Astor sisters who wrote a book with an academic. My brain does this occasionally. You're used to it by now. She one of the Astor sisters wrote a book with an academic from Birmingham University, which attempted to dis- distinguish between you and non you, where non you was for people with bad manners. So completely arbitrary and invented. Saying toilet, for example, was an indication of lower class sensibilities than saying lavatory or even loo or bog. Uh, I, I may have made up the second bit of that, but toilet certainly was problematical. Seti, I think, was problematical. Lounge. So they're trying to introduce Hyacinth Bucket. There you go. They turned it into a whole sitcom, didn't they? A rather splendid sitcom. But it is deliberately attempt. So they're the worst, the people who are trying to make other people feel bad by imposing a completely arbitrary set of sensibilities upon them. I'm with James. If you can't tell me in a sentence why that's wrong, so you're listening to your stuff on the tube, I can't, you're, you're disturbing everybody else. That's obviously wrong. You're putting your elbows on the table. Was it one of the Mitfords? Am I thinking of the Mitfords? Am I think uh, Mitford, did I say Asta? Mitfords. Mitfords. <sighs> Mitfords, Nancy Mitford, one of the Mitfords, wrote a book with some Birmingham academic about I, 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 you and non you. It was there. You go. We've got. We've got there in the end. Nancy, I think it is. It's twelve forty-eight. James O'Brien on LBC. It is twelve fifty-one, and it is, it's actually gone perhaps in a different direction from the one I expected. In that I'm I'm conjuring up more sympathy for people who 
reject some elements of etiquette, some elements of table manners, elbows on the table in particular, as long as you're not invading anybody else's space, you, you're, you're, I mean, what on earth is the objection to that? So you're literally only using it as a sort of code for membership, socioeconomic membership. And I got my Nancy's mixed up when I said Asta. It was Nancy Mitford, I think, who did the book with the uh, uh, academic from Birmingham about, about words that common people give away their background by using. Um, many of which are in my vocabulary today, but I, I, I remember the you know the, the tension, if you like, between um, uh, sofa and settee, or lounge and sitting room, or drawing room, actually, or pantry even. I, as I'm reading at the moment, where they use a pan rich people have a pantry as something he discovered. Twelve fifty two is the time. Ben's in Canterbury. Ben, what would you like to say? Hi, good afternoon, James. How are Hello, you? Hello, Ben. Very well, thank you. I, I'm quite surprisingly zen about all this. What about you? Uh, enjoying it thoroughly. Mm. Actually, one of your previous callers just sort of brought forward one of my ultimate pet peeves. Go on. Um, it was a lady who mentioned about no thanks for giving people, yielding to people who are running past. Yeah. And mine, I'm not sure if it's shared. It's got to be when you're in the supermarket or a shop and the person at the checkout gives you no recognition, no acknowledgement with the transaction, uh, gets to the point where they won't even tell you the price or just turn the card machine to you and not say thank you when you leave. It is odd, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it's, it's also very bad for business. But, uh, like yourself, I've had previous experience in customer service and client-facing roles, mm. and I would never have dreamt if someone's coming to spend their money in my establishment or somewhere I work for, I wouldn't have rep represented well. Did but you... I've noticed that... Go on. Sorry. No, you go on. I've noticed the rise with the headsets that you see in a lot of the supermarkets. Really? As people listening to their own thing? Well, they have, um, say, for example, you're at a checkout and you've got a split bag of sugar and they need to call somebody. To oh, OK. Up right. For you. Yes. OK. So, so, they're, so they're distracted by that. They're not listening to me on, on, on LBC or anything like that. <laughs> no, sadly not. Um, they seem to have a conversation between the staff and not even acknowledge you. So rather than just using it for a direct communication, they're actually having their own communication. Yeah, and, and, and therefore they've sort of zoned out your, your presence. You're just there for completely different reasons. Do you know what Upside Down Management is? Not familiar, no. So it's a book, among other things. I don't think it's actually called Upside Down Management. That's the subtitle of the book by James Timpson, who, whose family... Uh, run the Timpsons chain, but they, they own lots of other things as well, including Snappy Snaps. And James is popping up on full disclosure shortly. We've already recorded it. And upside down management means that uh, as the CEO of Timpsons Group, he prioritises the satisfaction of his staff and what that gives back to society. So what you describe is a consequence of thinking that the people on the front line are the least important people in the business structure. So why the hell should they care about you or even care about anything other than just getting through the day, clocking off the hours, get, getting their wages and going home? But but Timpson, James, who I was really enjoyed talking to, um, he describes them as being the ones who have to put money in the till and look the part. And looking the part is part of the customer care and the customer service, which is why his outlets, his high street outlets, um, almost always are staffed by people who will behave in the precisely opposite way to the one that you've just described. Yeah, it's your first and last point of contact with a customer. You want them to have an experience they wish to repeat. But to do so, they've got to be happy. So I'm also speaking from a position of some sympathy for the person on the checkout here. In that if, 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 you, know, if you are treated shabbily or you are treated as an afterthought or, 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 or treated badly, then you will behave badly. His, his, his ethos is that um, cultivating a happy workforce is absolutely crucial to business success. And the numbers support him, but I'm with you. I mean, I will notice it. It's only since meeting him that I found myself wondering whether the actual responsibility for this sort of sullenness at the coalface lies further up the managerial chain of command and that with the right management, this person would actually be behaving a lot better. So it's a cracking episode, actually. I, I, I mean, delightfully so. It's an amazing family, the Timpsons. His mum fostered loads and loads of children when they were growing up to the point where James and his, his, his siblings would come down, his biological siblings would come down to breakfast and find kids they'd never met before wearing some of their old clothes and things like that. And I, I think that's part of the reason why he started visiting prisons uh, a few years ago and hiring staff from prisons. So they've got some, it's a, just a fascinating story. Really good interview. Thank you, Ben, for reminding me of it, actually, and giving me an opportunity to 
to flag it up. Um, last word on this, I think, to Sarah in Derby. Sarah, what's it going to be? Oh, hi. Excited to speak to you, actually. Well, I hope um, it lives up to expectations. I'm sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm ta- listening to a lot of your callers talking yes. about elbows on tables and things like that. That kind of thing doesn't bother me. No. As long as people are being respectful, they can eat with their hands if they want to. Yes, and I think you're in right. a lot of cultures, they do. But if somebody's eating with their mouth open and I can see it all and I can hear it all, we're in a country where that's not culturally acceptable. It shouldn't really know. be culturally acceptable anywhere, in my opinion. But so these things evolve, don't they? Things evolve in this way. Yeah. But from my sort of point of view, it's it's based on noise, other people's noise. Yes. That yes. sort of reflects a real lack of consideration and a lack of respect for other people around them. I mean, I think I have something called misophonia, which is like an emotional response to noise that to, other to people... common noises. To common noises. Yeah, to so common it's not noises. like fingernails on a blackboard. It's something like chewing or yawning yeah. or something that other people yeah, would or... do without even thinking that it might annoy somebody. Exactly, or heavy breathing, and that's a me problem. You know, people yeah. can't help the way that they breathe, but. For an example, I live on a terrace street and most people are really respectful of others, but there are two guys that live at the end of the street and they often get together, usually over the summer, and they sit in one of them's garden room, windows wide open, smoking, drinking, playing really loud music at midnight and honest to God, the red mist. Just because you know, you know that they know, or, or at least the very least you know is that they couldn't give a fig about you. Exactly. And, you know, I don't think they have children, but if they did, their children would think that this is purely, uh, completely acceptable behaviour. And, and then it is literally antisocial. I can't believe it's that we've, so not, we've not used the phrase antisocial more. This That's exactly what it is. There's nothing antisocial about putting your elbows on the table. There's something very antisocial about having a a loud, regular loud get together with your windows wide open on a residential street and it's antisocial to, to spit or to eat with your mouth open so that's how you do it uh, Sarah you've taken me up to the wire I, I, I'm sorry we didn't have longer such such was such was your anticipation so thank you very much for that I've got the last word on the on the peas question for you uh, and uh, I offer this up with full academic background um, in terms of what you do with a fork and the peas I eat my peas with honey I've done it all my life it makes the peas taste funny, but it keeps them on the knife. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can also, of course, rewind and pause live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. I, I, got, a, I got a little message from, uh, from Sheila Fogarty shortly before... Shortly before, which I can't, I can't quite read it out on on the wireless. But you, you, you haven't seen rage until you've seen me. Dot dot dot. I shall leave that hanging. Sheila, with you next. And, until you've seen me tackling social at Hams. James O'Brien on LBC.